hoping this is coming through okay. Um, with any behind the scenes show, I have no idea what can go wrong. So I'm gonna pop into the chat here. The stream's probably gonna get a little bit busy, but first and foremost, if you could tell me if you could hear me, that would be awesome. Uh, so just let me on that. I was running a little bit late, so something is probably screwed up somehow. So we will see what happens there. Uh, but if you guys could let me know, sounds good. Mike is a little low. I always wonder what to do when I get uh, mic check. Um, looks like it's going okay. Quiet, loud and clear. Look at that. So some of you either need to turn your volume up or uh, how about this? Um, I went ahead and turned it up a little bit. Audio a touch low, volume on mine. Let me test uh, something else out. Th this is the wonder of the live stream behind the scenes is I want everything to be perfect. It never is. So what we're going to do is test this. What I want you guys to do is tell me if you hear audio. So it's better. Okay. So I'm better. Awesome. If you guys can tell me, I think I've screwed this up somehow. Bear with me. Nope. That's not it. See, these are the joys of these live shows. There we go. How's that? Can you guys hear good old Dr. Kirkpatrick? That's a big help because <clears throat> it's not your audio, it's their ears. <laughs> I, you know, you, you get differing points of view here. Nothing. Uh, so no, he's silent. Well, that's not good. Uh, let me see here. Not cool at all. How about... Oh, that's what I was afraid of, but <clears throat> okay. So no volume on him. So bear with me here. So again, the, the while I'm trying to figure this out at this point, let me try one other thing. And I appreciate your patience on this. The behind the scenes shows are exactly this. They just kind of uh, sadly have bugs. And then we edit it down and actually do the real video later. But I try and do no errors anyway. But let me go ahead and try this. <clears throat> All right, one more time. Now can you hear him? All right, did you guys hear that? No. Wow. Why is it not playing? Because um, <clears throat> if I can't get that out, then there's kind of no point in doing the show. <laughs> um, you should be able to hear that. Why not? Because the whole thing is like a, a gig and a half in size, so I can't upload it to my streaming platform. I won't take it, I don't think. So that's the problem. So bear with me, guys. A couple more things here. Wait, did my, my audio must have gotten worse, I'm guessing. Let's try this one more time. As of this week, uh, we are tr tracking over a total of 650 cases. So my audio is still As fine. How about now week, on Kirkpatrick? Uh, we are tracking over a total of 650 cases. There you go. There, there, there we go. Okay, so you guys can hear Kirkpatrick now, yeah? Seems like it. We got sound. Perfect. And he sounds good level-wise with me because that's what stinks about this As streaming platform. This week, uh, we are tracking is that I can't tell levels and I am OCD when it comes to all of that kind of stuff. Good. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and pretend that it's, that it's there. I'm going to take my iced coffee now. That's my blunder for the day. Um, okay. So here's the deal. Decided to stream on all platforms. Uh, if you guys are watching live on Facebook or 
Twitter uh, or wherever it may be. Just know these behind the scenes. I sometimes do that. We'll just blast it everywhere. Uh, but these uh, platforms, uh, other than YouTube, don't have everything. So if you're not aware, go to theblackvault.com slash live. Again, that's www.theblackvault.com slash live. As and uh, week. oh, stop it, Kirk. Pat. There we go. Uh, and that will bounce you to the YouTube channel. That way you guys don't miss uh, anything. These behind the scenes shows are just that. As you can see, they're blunders, there's mistakes. Uh, I had one time my dog came through the back uh, and, and jumped on my lap in the middle of the stream. So who knows what happens during these things. Uh, but that's essentially kind of the fun of them. What happens after is I take the segment itself, I clip it, and then uh, edit if I have to, and then uh, schedule a, a later broadcast for you guys to kind of watch together in that more structured form have the, the chat room again. Obviously, you guys are here. It's a couple hundred of you already watching uh, that I can see here on my counter through the different uh, streams. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, I will try and answer uh, any question that you guys have as I go, but I'm going to be honest with you. It's very, very difficult, especially as we get a couple hundred people in the room and everybody's kind of chatting and having fun uh, to watch for those questions becomes very, very difficult. Uh, but then on top of that, <clears throat> excuse me, on top of all that, it's they're just hard to see uh, on top of uh, on top of everything else. So on YouTube, this isn't a ploy to get super chats. Uh, but if I do take questions and you notice they're primarily super chats, that's not a ploy. I don't try and favor those. I give everybody a shot. I, I don't ask for your money. It's a free channel, but they stick out on my side. So there's uh, bright colors uh, and they pop up on my screen here. Anybody that uses StreamYard knows that. And that's kind of the difference. So please know I'm not favoring anybody. Uh, the only other way I recommend people to ask questions is all caps. If you think I'm ignoring you, don't think that. I may not see it or it may not be time for me to pull in a question. Uh, but just so you know that I am live, this is a great question. Has John Foyad the rest of Kirkpatrick's, Kirkpatrick's slides from Hides and Long Grass? Uh, that is a great question. The answer is yes. So I went after everything. I posted that on social media that everything he utilized in the classified briefing, whether that material was classified or not, I'm going after it. Uh, so great question, but I just wanted to show you guys I am uh, really live. Uh, this isn't a, a pre-record. So here's what we're going to do is uh, I give that that break point. So we're just going to like pause here for like 10 seconds. And I'm just going to jump into it. One quick note too before we get started, uh, and I'll probably say this in the actual recording as well. Uh, these deep dives aren't for everybody. It is going to be lengthy. And yes, it'll probably last longer than the hearing itself. But what I like to do is break down certain important parts and, um, you know, maybe point some stuff out that you've already seen before. If not, do some stuff that uh, uh, you have seen, but maybe expand on it and pose some questions you may not have thought of. And if we're all in agreement, great. And we're f if we're in disagreement, not a problem. Uh, just remember to keep it respectful in those chat rooms and comments. All right, so that said, <clears throat> as I clear my throat and die here, give me one second. You'll see me kind of going back and forth between monitors. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and start it. And when I say goodbye, when we're all said and done, uh, that will be for the, uh, again, I call it the recording, even though we're recording now. Uh, I don't go away. I'll come back, and then we'll, we'll finish up. If you guys got some questions, uh, in addition to what we did during the live stream, I'll try and hang out as long as I can. I have no idea how long this is going to last though. So we're just all going to learn together. So, uh, sit tight and we'll get started in a second. That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and taking this journey inside the Black Vault with me. I am John Greenwald Jr., creator of theblackvault.com, and today we are dissecting last week's UAP hearing. Many of you were probably let down because you wanted to have some kind of unbelievable evidence presented to us. There was a lot of hype about this hearing. Uh, a lot of YouTubers and social media personalities, they were all hyping it up. Some were saying that, well, here we are taking another step to disclosure, while other ones were on the opposite end of the scale. They were saying, look, don't get your hopes up because you're probably not going to see much. Wherever you were on the spectrum, 
at the end of the day, of course, it's going to be a letdown. Anybody that has interest in UFOs, even if you're a genuine skeptic but care about the evidence, you're going to be let down. Uh, the problem uh, with the hearing is there wasn't a whole lot that uh, we didn't know, with few exceptions. And that's what I'm going to go through in this deep dive. Uh, these deep dives, I know, are not for everybody. They can be long. In fact, I don't know how long this video will end up, but more likely than not, it will be longer than the actual hearing itself. So what's the point? Uh, for me, I've noticed that a lot of you, not everybody, but a lot of you like to not necessarily watch that raw hearing because let's face it, it can get tedious and boring. Um, but also it's a way for all of us to just talk about it. I love your comments that you put in the channel. Anything that I say in these videos, when I label it an opinion or obviously speculate, I don't claim to be right. I never have. Um, I don't have all the answers, but what I like to do is throw stuff out there for you guys in these deep dives, those that like to sit through them, uh, and then, uh, hear that feedback in return. Cause I always learn something from all of you as well. So hopefully I can offer you kind of my perspective, uh, based on dealing with the government for so many years. Uh, but also I'm interested to hear from you. So if you're watching on YouTube, there's obviously the comment section. So make sure that you place your comments and while you're down there, a pretty big help to this channel is to make sure you click on the thumbs up button if you feel that it's worth it and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you're watching on any other platform, I stream behind the scenes shows, Facebook, Twitter, they all kind of get the stream. Uh, if you're watching on those platforms, great, I'll do this in the future, but it's definitely not getting all of the content. So make sure you go to www.theblackvault.com slash live. That will bounce you to the channel. That will make sure that you're notified when you turn the notifications on, that is, of all the future streams. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have a lot of fun in the future. So let's go ahead and bring up some visuals here and let's just kind of get started. Uh, what I, again, I'm going to do is this deep dive analysis into the UAP hearing from my perspective. Again, a lot of opinion and pure speculation. I'll try and label those parts as such, but also play a bunch of clips for you as well. So we'll just kind of go through and hear from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the one witness, uh, if you want to call him that, the expert that came in. He heads Arrow, that UFO office within the Pentagon that's investigating unidentified anomalous phenomena. At least that's the acronym of the day. Maybe it changed this morning again. Who knows? Um, but one thought before we really get rolling uh, is something that I posted immediately on social media. If you didn't notice it. And that is quite simply the attendance. Uh, the attendance was, uh, uh, I would say, an embarrassment when it comes to this type of an issue. Not because we all love UFOs, but rather we know that the root of whatever this this is, whatever, you want to call it foreign uh, technology, spy equipment, you want to call it aliens, or whatever in between, there is a national security aspect uh, that Congress and the Senate should, should worry about. Like uh, the, these politicians that represent us and care about our safety should have packed this room. Now, to be fair, there was a classified version of the same hearing just prior to the public hearing. Now, I've heard rumors, I didn't speak to the committee or, or staffers myself, but the rumor was that logistically, it was just better for everybody to do that in that way. For me, I'll throw this thought out there. I think stuff like that is strategic. And here's why. When you watch the last hearing with Scott Bray and Ronald Moultrie, when they touched on things that were too sensitive, the responses were, well, we can deal with that, but more in a, a, a closed session or the classified setting. Even though we don't get the answer to the question, we know what the question was that tip that off, that says, hey, wait a minute, we can't talk about this aspect. Uh, we can talk about it more in a closed session. Well, that stinks because we can't hear anything about it. Uh, however, we can understand what was getting into a classified territory, what was sensitive enough for them to say, hey, uh, we can't talk about this because everybody is listening. So we got to go in behind closed doors with only people that have clearance. Well, sadly, uh, we didn't have that this time. Not a single question from those senators that did show up had uh, really anything that was sensitive, meaning uh, Kirkpatrick didn't have to say, we have to do this in a classified setting. So that's the downside to that. And whether or not that was strategic, look, if you ask me, I bet you it was because 
we, meaning people like me that go after that information, know what's pushing that sensitive area. And we didn't get that in this hearing, which is an absolute letdown. Uh, but regardless, whatever the reason is, you look at all of this. Let me turn the laser pointer on. Not that you can't see the uh, empty seats here. Yeah, there we go. All those empty seats, all those members of the committee that didn't even bother to show up. And this, uh, these two here, Kirsten Gillibrands and Joni Ernst, uh, don't look too incredibly thrilled in this shot. So, I mean, I only giggle because it, it was a little bit um, tedious at times to listen to. The opposite end, you had the audience itself. Not a whole lot of chairs in the room, and yet a lot of chairs were empty. On top of that, you had people that were not from the mainstream media. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I want to point out my buddy over here, Dan Warren, who runs a great uh, TikTok channel. He's also on uh, Twitter and and so on. Uh, great individual, awesome human being. Kudos to him for showing up. A couple other, a couple other uh, people as well that were not part of the mainstream media, but were there uh, to essentially take part in this. Uh, let's let's call it a historic event. Uh, but I don't see this back row lined with cameras. Why not? There were some cameras floating, but but where's the attention? This is a, a pretty important uh, event here, a very important topic. Again, regardless of where you fall on the spectrum of what this is, but where is everybody? And that to me is absolutely, when you juxtapose that with the first hearing, is a lot different. I saw a lot more cameras. I saw a lot more bodies. I saw a lot more attention. Now, we heard a little bit about this in, in mainstream media, but not a whole lot. And I got into a lot of heat, which, you know, happens a lot in my, in, my, in my neck of the woods on social media, but got a lot of heat for saying that maybe congressional interest is waning in this topic. I said this, uh, I don't know, mid to late last year, simply because of the lack of push to get that report that was supposed to be out in 2022, didn't come out till 2023. There was really like no, like no one cared. And in fairness, maybe they were talking behind the scenes, but nobody came out and said, hey, look, we know it's late. Uh, X, Y, Z is going on. It's fine. We're familiar with the delay. On the contrary, it was just like no one cared. And that's what was the very frustrating thing. So is this evidence now that that statement is becoming more true? That not only from the other shot you have, you know, that uh, lack of, of, of congressional interest and, and the lack of senators that showed up, but also the other side. That kudos to those two that had uh, shown up in the room, but the mainstream media was not there. And uh, that's a shame, given the importance of what we're talking about and the implications behind it. One of the other broad stroke things that I'll point out is the tone itself. I think if you're like me, it was kind of brutal in part. And I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. And I am one of those geeks that actually watches these types of hearings. But it felt forced to me. Now, I know uh, scripted isn't the right word because it literally was scripted in the beginning with opening statements and so on and so forth. So that's not really the right way to phrase it. But forced is a way to say it for me, that he just seemed uncomfortable being there. Maybe he doesn't like cameras. Maybe he doesn't like public settings. So I'm not bashing Dr. Kirkpatrick in any way whatsoever. But all I'm saying is when you watch it, it was like, oh, my goodness. Like there was a couple parts putting these clips together that I would drift off and I was like, oh God, I didn't, I missed that. And I'd go back and I'd listen to it again. And I'd drift off again going, what did he just say? Go back again and listen to it because it was tough. Now, again, that's not meant to be insulting, but when somebody's um, essentially forced to be there and forced to essentially say certain things, uh, it's not as passionate. It's not as exciting. Uh, and that's what uh, sadly was the outcome of all of this. Now, what if that was also strategic? Make it just so god-awfully boring, who would want to cover it? I worked in television for many years, as many of you know, and when you're working for companies like the History Channel and Discovery Channel and all those guys, every single soundbite needs to work, right? You don't have fluff. You don't have extra stuff in there. You clip it and edit it to make it exciting every step of the way, because if you lose your audience, what happens? They change the channel. So you look for sound bites in the interviews. You go through transcripts first, then you go to the video and you see how exciting it really is. If it's dull, it, the words could be pretty cool, but sadly the video will lose the viewer. This was hard to pick out those sound bites because you didn't have 
any t- anything really when it came to the tone. It was just kind of monotone, and in my opinion, forced is the best way to explain it. But when you get through all those kind of broad stroked um, characteristics, in my mind, there were certain things that had come out that were pretty interesting. First and foremost, the fact that Dr. Kirkpatrick had said that there is now, as of the week of April 17th, which happened to be my birthday, uh, there were a total of 650 cases, 650. So those 650 are what Arrow has collected in and essentially numbered and are in their system, so as to speak. As of this week, uh, we are tracking over a total of 650 cases. So 650 cases. Now, how does that stack up? Well, for those of you who read the articles that I published, I think I did a video about this as well. Uh, I had received a list of the cases with nothing but the serial numbers, which, yes, in large part is kind of useless unless you utilize the FOIA or are keeping track of how Arrow is putting all of this together behind the scenes. It's going to be a puzzle. We're not going to get the whole picture up front. We got to piece it all together. So this was a very important list of material that I got through FOIA listing all the case numbers because number one it showed us how they were doing it number two it showed us what serial numbers we could request but then on top of that it told us a number and that number as of December 6th of 2022 was 511 now to put that uh, uh, in comparison with what we knew previous that report that was published in 2023 had data through August 30th, 2022. uh, And that number was 510. Only one case had been added to Arrow's database that they felt worthy. One case from October, or excuse me, August 30th through December 6th of 2022. Now go from that date to the week of April 17th. Now we're at over 650. Not sure why there was a lack of a jump towards the end of 2022 and in my opinion a bigger jump in the beginning of 2023 but regardless that's where we have so that's kind of an outline of how fast they're growing and taking cases in only adding one case by the way was really intriguing to me it wasn't a letdown it was actually an encouragement that maybe they are vetting these things and truly only going for the real anomalous cases or they just went on vacation and didn't care One of the two, but that turns out to be about 139 cases from December 6th of last year to April 17th of this year. Another interesting thing gleamed from the interview was the fact that Arrow has conducted nearly two dozen interviews. I'll play the clip later because there's a little bit more context that I'll deal with later on uh, in this deep dive. But essentially what uh, what he had stated was that there were two uh, about two, two dozen people that had been brought in. And from what we understand from his testimony, they were largely, if not all, brought in by the recommendation of either senators that were in the room, uh, maybe Kirsten Gillibrand or uh, others that had referred them over to Arrow. Quite intriguing. Now, because others have posted online being interviewed, uh, namely Robert Solis, which is public record, he put that out there on social media, he was interviewed by Arrow that they were taking his testimony in about his experiences through the uh, uh, UFO encounters over nuclear bases and, and his firsthand account of what he experienced. I used that and went, OK, if they interviewed one, they interviewed more. So when Solace had posted that online, I had filed a FOIA request for the transcript of every single interview that they had done up until that point. I'm also going for videos and stuff like that if they took it. Uh, But usually transcripts are going to be one of the easier things to get. A quick uh, reference to past times that I've done that. I got Luis Elizondo's transcript when he was interviewed by the Department of Defense Office of the Inspector General. And you can read uh, pretty much the whole thing. There's redactions, obviously, uh, but you can but you can read through that. So what they do is when they do these interviews, sometimes it's audio, sometimes it's video, uh, but then they transcribe it. And then that's generally what they what they have behind the scenes more than all else. So that is uh, something that I've been been going for. So now I know through this congressional testimony, there's at least two dozen that I could potentially get my my hands on. 
I should also state clearly for the record that in our research, Arrow has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. Oh, you know that that upset a lot of people when he said when he said that because the verbiage that he used, the types of wording that he used, off-world vehicles. Well, that's what we heard through the New York Times, namely sourced to Dr. Eric Davis, defying the known laws of physics. We know that there's a couple people that have been hinting and outright saying that type of stuff, making these big claims and podcasts on YouTube channels, even on mainstream media, not citing specific cases or specifics, but rather just either alluding to it or saying, oh, these things are defying known laws of physics or they are evidence of off-world vehicles or legacy programs or whatever. And yet he uses that same wording and says there's no credible evidence of that. Now, do we take him at his word? Oh, I'll let you guys decide. He could absolutely be lying. All of the aforementioned people that are out there making those types of claims could absolutely be telling the truth. Here's the issue, though. In my opinion, that testimony goes against those that we know who have been interviewed, those that we hope have been interviewed, and those that have been rumored to have been interviewed. Bob Lazar, Robert Bigelow, head of the OSAP program that kind of started this whole mess, allegedly. Hal Putoff, one of the main guys who worked with Bass and Robert Bigelow on OSAP. Luis Elizondo, who says that he headed the program for years investigating UAP, and he called his program ATIP. Dr. Eric Davis, while his notes, I put it in air quotes because I don't think they're genuine or depict real events, I should say, his notes are brought up in the last UAP hearing. Now, if his notes are true about his meeting, with Admiral Will Thomas Wilson, if all of that is true, it goes against everything that we have been taught as humans. Full stop, right? It would change the world. There's not a single politician who would not want their name attached to changing the world. You would think that if they put that into congressional record and ask Ronald Moultrie and Scott Bray and put it out there, even if they didn't know what that story was, you would think by then to now, they would have done something to try and cooperate it. Right. I mean, I would think so. So did they interview Eric Davis? How about James Lekatsky, who, again, was part of OSAP and so on and so forth? Uh, Jay Stratton, any of these individuals, did they interview them and were they not credible? If not, why not? So I think at this point, if they haven't been interviewed, all of these individuals who have been alluding to some very, let's say, far out there material, even though they're not encroaching on their security oaths, if they know that Kirkpatrick is lying or Kirkpatrick is not getting his proper access to what needs to be known, then things need to be done. Right? I mean, I would think that they would scream to the high heavens. And yet I haven't seen any of them come out and say, you know what? Uh, I will not violate my oath. But I will say with the whistleblower protection or if Kirsten Gillibrand really wants to know and so on and so forth, I will testify under oath. And although some of those things may have been said in a YouTube podcast or whatever, uh, then let's do it. Get a message to Kirsten Gillibrand and say he lied to all of you, your committee, to the Senate to the American people, or to be fair to him, to, to Sean, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, if he does not have the access, but any of these individuals do or did, then say he is not getting the right information. But where is that? We don't. We're getting books, right? We're getting some podcasts here and there. Uh, and of course, we get the anonymous sources. Did Arrow track down any of these classified leaks that all of these YouTubers are talking about? I remember this one from the uh, release of the UAP report, the, the first one, I think, in was it 2021? And around the same time, Richard Dolan had put a, a slide up of what was leaked to him that day. And to him, it was a very credible source, which I think was his way of describing it. 
and uh, essentially uh, it might be hard to see on your screen, uh, but was talking about ET related or extraterrestrial related items, alien technology, stuff that goes well beyond what was really in the classified report. Now, when this was posted and broadcast out there, the classified report had not been released in part. I started fighting for it the, the morning after the 2021 report was published to the public. I went after the classified version. And a lot of people mocked that, that effort. They said, you're never going to get anything. Now, although I didn't get everything, I did get a lot of it. And it was pretty clear that the message overall was pretty much echoing what the public was being told in the public report. A lot of redactions, including the shapes of UAP and so on and so forth. So don't get me wrong, there was still a lot hidden. But there was no way that ET technology was in the classified report uh, when in the public report it, it wasn't. There, there, there's, I'm sorry, there's just not, right? Like nobody's been able to say that. And this has kind of gone away. I haven't heard really any, anybody talk about this. This kind of stuff needs to be called out. This kind of stuff needs to be dealt with. It doesn't help people like Kirkpatrick, who's trying to, let's just take him at his word, trying to make sense of all of this and trying to do a scientific effort, but it doesn't help with any of us either. It doesn't help anywhere. So to just blast out, oh, look what was leaked to me by these anonymous sources, no. And the fact that nobody's getting arrested and nobody's being investigated, First Amendment is pretty powerful, even when it comes to fabrication. So a lot of um, rebuttals that I see out there that he's uh, that certain people are not being investigated or anything like that. Um, I, look, you, you go down a rabbit hole when it comes to those types of investigations. But in my opinion, all of this type of stuff is bunk. All those social media accounts uh, citing their anonymous sources and my source told me this great. Well, now's the time to put up. If any of these anonymous people that are helping either YouTubers or social media accounts, it's time to step up. You can do so without telling the public your identity, but go directly to the Senate. If Kirkpatrick does not have access himself or he is lying, then now's the time to either put up or shut up. Because as anybody knows on this, on this channel, I do not care for anonymous sources at all because most of the time it's all bunk anyway and provable, but most of the time when it's not provable per se, it's highly unlikely any of it is true. But that brings me to the small percentage of leaks that actually does intrigue me. And yet for whatever reason, we don't see any evidence at this point of investigation on why UAP previous leaks are not being investigated. Now, did Arrow look into these? Do they echo what the public is being told through anonymous sources and we're talking about flying triangles and this Baghdad phantom is, is unexplained. I don't know. I don't have the, the answer to that. But I've hinted at this in past videos and I think now is the time to just come out with this particular quote because this is where it's getting really interesting. I may not always agree with Jeremy Corbell, but he's intrigued me for, for quite a few years now because he's obviously getting material that is legitimate, that the Pentagon has commented on with now a couple of exceptions, but in the beginning they were commenting on it. So I was always intrigued by that. But the most recent was the most intriguing, not because of the object, but because the fact that an MQ-9 Reaper drone, a highly classified piece of equipment, its video I knew was classified. Now that what they call the security classification guide, there is one for the MQ-9. I'm going after that document. But I knew just from research that the MQ-9 footage, anything that's taken on that platform is inherently classified. And what that means is, is that per that security classification guide, it is automatically classified. So they can't release anything unless there was a specific mission to go out, take a video for release to the public after sanit sanitization. I finally got proof of that. That comes from the Air Combat Command Public Affairs. Here's the exact quote that was given to me. In accordance with general operational security practices and the MQ-9 security classification guide, all imagery captured by the MQ-9 is typically classified unless mission requirements dictate the need to sanitize any video footage for lower classification or public release purposes. The MQ-9 security classification guide and the details within 
is not releasable or available to the public in accordance with its own level of security classification. Well, to that last part, challenge accepted. Uh, I will go or I have already filed the case, but will continue to go after that security classification guide, I'll likely be highly redacted, but at least uh, I'm, I'm going to try and, and get that. Regardless of if I do, the point remains. The Baghdad Phantom shot by an MQ-9 was obviously not a PR mission for them to shoot that object for release to the public. So their generic statement of if that is the case, then yes, footage can be released. Um, it's classified. You can't take still frames of a classified video, call it an unclassified image. I don't know if Jeremy Corbell thinks that way, but just for anybody who does, you can't do that. Classified is classified, whether it's moving images or not. It's all the same when it comes to the security behind all of this. So where is the investigation, especially after the recent leaks of the, from the Department of Defense and our situation over in Ukraine, obviously nothing to do with UAP, but those leaks have created an uproar. The Pentagon had to, to, to do damage control. The guy was let out in cuffs. Obviously, leaks of classified material are important. But with UAP, we don't know why, but it just seems like nothing ever happens to anybody, nor does it even become an investigation. I'm still searching it. I Here's my personal opinion based on nothing but that. I believe this is being or quickly was or will be investigated, plain and simple. I think that there's too much now that the DOD is going to go, oh, MQ-9 Reaper footage, not a problem. Let's let that go. And yet they go after all this other stuff. That doesn't mean Jeremy Corbell did anything wrong. I won't make a whole diatribe here on journalists publishing classified information, so on and so forth. That's a whole legal area I'm not even going to bother you or bore you with. But rather, I think the overall situation and the fact that it got out in the first place is going to be investigated if it's not being already. Uh, and yes, I am trying to pursue that story more. I've sat on that quote for about a month or so. Um, uh, on its own, it's not, like I, you're saying, why'd you sit on it? Well, because it fits into a much bigger story. And, and that bigger story, I think, is the investigation in that. The past leaks, like some of what you see here, were all taken by fairly you know, not sensitive platforms. Uh, so you've got the Snoopy team. I put some pictures of the actual Snoopy teams for the U S Navy down here. Uh, and, and the cameras they use, they're not, they're not a, a Reaper drone level classified piece of, of technology. Um, these are likely, you know, maybe just even cell phone photo videos or excuse me, still frames, uh, from the pilot. Uh, this obviously taken by, uh, uh, F 18, I think, right. The gimbal, um, and then the, the Omaha footage that, that leaked out, obviously not a, a highly p, uh, classified piece of equipment either. So, so it kind of ramped up to this MQ-9 release. And to me, that was more intriguing than this Baghdad Phantom. And what's also interesting is the fact that that got like the least amount of coverage. Why? I don't know. Waning interest? I'm not sure. But there wasn't really a whole lot of coverage to that latest leak. So for me, what's going to happen? And, and I, I'm, I'm super intrigued by that because I really have no idea. But I just believe deep down there is no way that they're going to let that stuff out in, into the open and not look into why. Arrow is leading a focused effort to better characterize, understand, and attribute UAP. With priority given to UAP reports by DOD and IC personnel in or near areas of national security importance. DOD fully appreciates the eagerness from many quarters, especially here in Congress and in the American public, to quickly resolve every UAP encountered across the globe from the distant past through today. It's important to note, however, ARO is the culmination of decades of DOD intelligence community and congressionally directed efforts to successfully resolve UAP encountered first and foremost by U.S. military personnel, specifically Navy and Air Force pilots. Decades. What's he talking about? I mean, if he's really laying the groundwork of decades, okay, let's accept the, the uh, those that have come out about OSAP and ATIP and it's all UFO and UAP related. That decades of material and, and uh, investigation that they've done, where is it? I can't find any. Right. And people like me, I'm not I'm not saying I'm the standalone uh, person trying to go after information, but where is it? 
That's what I don't understand. But yet he drops the decades uh, thing here. So what are they? What have they investigated for decades? And where is it? And what did they learn? Put a pin in that because I think that that'll be more important here as we go on. I want to underscore today that only a very small percentage of UAP reports display signatures that could reasonably be described as anomalous. The majority of unidentified objects reported to Aero demonstrate mundane characteristics of balloons, unmanned aerial systems, clutter, natural phenomena, or other readily explainable sources. A small percentage. And that makes sense for anybody who's been involved in UFO research, even prior to this present day conversation, knows that it's a very small percentage of UFO encounters that are truly UFOs. What's interesting, just a little bit of historical perspective, it actually lines up going back to 1955 and the statistics back then from Project Blue Book. You can see here that it broke down balloons, aircraft, other, not enough data, and the, the true unknowns, single digits. So obviously it coincides with what was in the past. So that's not a surprise to anybody, but I think those types of things are used because it makes it less, less impressive, less interesting to the general public. Oh, it's a very small percentage. So maybe if they had more data, uh, they would you know, be able to solve those too. Kirkpatrick, and I'll play the video in a little bit, said exactly that. And interestingly enough, so did they in 1955. As the study of the current case has progressed, it became increasingly obvious that if reporting and investigative, uh, investigating procedures could be further improved, the percentages of those ca cases uh, which contained insufficient information and those remaining unexplained would be greatly reduced. That's fine, though. Even I'll take a couple percent because that's weeding out all of the explained information. But what also concerns me is we're on the same exact path that we were in the 1950s. That's what is playing out here. And if you go back to a video on this very channel here on YouTube, uh, and if you're not watching on YouTube, just look for the Black Vaults Originals channel, and you will find a full breakdown about how what's, what was unfolding today and what is unfolding today is almost exactly what unfolded through the late 1950s and 60s and how this whole thing progressed, congressional hearings and all, whistleblowers and all, former government personnel and all. And it's a really interesting juxtaposition when you look at the two. I did that, what, two years ago now, probably? Some, somewhere in the last two years. Then when you look at this, we're seeing the exact same thing again, right down to the single percentage points and the thirst for more data, the need for more data. Well, what have they done for the last 60 plus years since the last time they said it? Arrow is a member of the department's support to the administration's Tiger Team effort to deal with stratospheric objects such as the PRC high altitude balloon. While when previously unknown objects are successfully identified, it is Arrow's role to quickly and efficiently hand off such readily explainable objects to the intelligence, law enforcement, or operational safety communities for further analysis and appropriate action. In other words, Arrow's mission is to turn UAP into SEP, somebody else's problem. He just seems so proud of that joke. Uh, so I had to put it in there. Somebody else's problem or SEP, I love to smirk after. So if that's what they're trying to do, they're just trying to explain and move it to the appropriate intelligence agencies. What's really concerning of, as an uh, overall kind of broad stroke note on that is why wasn't stuff like this in place before? It doesn't matter about UFOs or UAP talk anymore, but from a national security perspective, are you telling me that they weren't really looking into anything that they couldn't identify? NORAD or the NRO or NASA or anybody that they, w they didn't have any type of investigation process? That to me is incredible. Incredibly concerning. Meanwhile, for the few cases in all domains, space, air, and sea, that do demonstrate potentially anomalous characteristics, Arrow exists to help the DOD, IC, and interagency resolve those anomalous cases. In doing so, Arrow is approaching these cases with the highest level of objectivity and analytic rigor. This includes physically testing and employing modeling and simulation to validate our analyses and underlying theories then peer reviewing those results within the U.S. government 
industry partners, and appropriately cleared academic institutions before reaching any conclusions. Space, air, and sea. All the domains that we knew they were looking at, but I took the way that he just said that, is they have confirmed anomalous cases in space as well. Now, why is that surprising? Because we don't really hear about that a lot. We see the ground-based ones. We see the ones where the Navy's out at sea, and uh, that was at the first hearing and them explaining that one. The air one is obvious. Everything we see is pretty much uh, within close uh, you know, proximity to us. We're not talking about space-based objects and what we've seen. So what's there? And that has intrigued me. And yes, I'm going after those cases as well, specifically from that domain to see if Arrow will release anything that they have from that, again, targeted domain. Because when you go for all 650 cases through FOIA, a quick FOIA note for the FOIA users out there, that is an example of what will likely be too burdensome of a request. That's too much work for them to go through and declassify 650. Why? A lot of them are in draft form. They haven't been touched yet. They haven't been analyzed. And you're going to have to then uh, review all of that information for declassification. They'll reject it and kick it back. So you have to go through specific uh, cases with a, a specific target in mind. So that particular case that I filed was all of the space domain to try and get those. Another part of that clip that was really interesting to me was industry partners and appropriate cleared academic institutions appropriately cleared. What does that mean? Classified information is my guess. So now, I'm not insinuating any of the logos that I have on screen here are involved at all. But I do know that there's been a lot of talk and that there's been a lot of rumor and speculation about those that you see on the screen. So I want to stress that again. I am not saying uh, that any one of these uh, organizations have classified clearances and they're looking into um, these UAP sightings, not telling you or I. Uh, they preach transparency, but uh, essentially are siding with secrecy. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is it's incredibly concerning to hear that we're going down the same path yet again that we did in the late 50s, 1960s, the ramp up to the um, essentially the closing of Project Blue Book, where certain academic ins institutions got involved, that they looked at that information and said, nope, UAP isn't worthwhile. It's not a threat to national security. Let's move on. That we are on that path again. On top of that, appropriately clearing private institutions, we should know who that is. Why? Because a lot of organizations are out there preaching transparency. But I also believe that they would be interested in taking that government contract or consulting gig if given the opportunity. So where do you draw the line? Do you take that just so you can go ahead and see that information, but keep it within a private entity or organization? I hope not. And again, I'm not saying that anything that you see on screen here, including the Galileo Project, UAPX, Enigma Labs, or Radiance Technologies, for those listening to the audio version, I'm not saying that they're involved in that, but that's where it gets concerning. Let's look at the Galileo Project for a minute. I interviewed Dr. Avi Loeb when he first announced the project, and I was incredibly encouraged by it. But since he started, you now have a lot of uh, former government people that have a lot of rumor attached to them and a lot of speculation attached to them. Uh, so with them being involved, could it get to a point where Dr. Loeb's team does find something? If they're appropriately cleared, that means that they may have some security clearances that go along with their ability to work with Arrow. And to put the icing on the cake on that hypothetical scenario is that would the government say, sorry, Dr. Loeb, or sorry, UAPX, or sorry, Enigma Labs, or sorry, Radiance Technologies, um, you can't talk about this. We have to classify it, and your security oath takes over. Your security clearance applies here. And that's what I'm concerned about is we're doing full circle right back to where we started decades ago. And that is secrecy. We see it with the U.S. government, but now they're pulling in industry partners and appropriately cleared academic institutions. Who exactly is that? I'll let you guys decide. In the event sufficient scientific data were ever obtained, that a UAP encountered can only be explained by extraterrestrial origin. We are committed to working with our interagency partners at NASA to appropriately inform U.S. government's leadership of its findings. 
for those few cases that have leaked to the public previously and subsequently commented on by the U.S. government, I encourage those who hold alternative theories or views to submit your research to credible peer-reviewed scientific journals. Arrow is working very hard to do the same. That is how science works, not by blog or social media. Not by blog or social media. Um, the first call is NASA. That in, in interested me more than all else. So if Arrow finds anything that's even remotely close to or confirmed as extraterrestrial, they pick up the phone, they call NASA. NASA then in turn informs all the government heads and agencies. Where's the general public? Now, maybe that's just, you know, I'm reading into that too much, but nowhere did he say the public had any right to know any of that information, but rather he laid the groundwork to inform NASA, which I'm kind of surprised that, that Arrow being part of the Department of Defense would essentially call NASA first. So that part didn't make sense to me. And maybe I'm just misreading this. So, you know, if I am, I'll apologize in advance. But I took Arrow gets that evidence. They pick up the phone. They call NASA. NASA picks up the phone. They call all the agency heads and, and government agencies. But nowhere in there was the general public and any type of effort to transparency. One of the things that Arrow does is high integrity analysis, as I've said. This chart represents the trend analysis of all the cases in U Arrow's holdings, right, to date. What you'll see on the left is a histogram of all of our reported sightings as a function of altitude. So most of our sightings occur in the 15 to 25,000 foot range. And that is ultimately because that's where a lot of our aircraft are. On the far right upper corner, you'll see a breakout of the morphologies of all of the UAP that are reported. Over half, about 52% of what's been reported to us are round orb spheres. The rest of those break out into all kinds of different other shapes. The gray box is essentially there is no data on what its shape is. Either it wasn't reported or the uh, sensor did not collect it. The bottom uh, map is a heat map of all reporting areas across the globe that we have available to us. What you'll notice is that there is a heavy, what we call collection bias, both in altitude and in geographic location. That's where all of our sensors exist. That's where our training ranges are. That's where our operational ranges are. That's where all of our platforms are. In the middle, what we have done is reduce the most typically reported UAP characteristics to these uh, fields, mostly round, mostly one to four meters, white, silver, translucent, metallic, 10,000 to 30,000 feet, with apparent velocities from stationary to Mach 2. No thermal exhausts usually detected. We get intermittent radar returns. We get intermittent radio returns. And we get intermittent thermal signatures. That's what we're looking for and trying to understand what that is. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're trying to understand. So I'll let most of that speak for itself. But the one thing that I will point out is this graph here, which are the shapes. For those of you who have watched this channel or watched my work, when I got that classified UAP report from 2021 finally released, one of the biggest things that stuck out, not only to me, but I think everyone, was the fact that they wouldn't even tell us the shapes or the common shapes of UAP. It was all blacked out. Now, I appealed that. That appeal is still open, but I specifically targeted that section in my appeal as a ridiculous redaction. Uh, I found a much more legal uh, sound way to put it, but uh, fought that specifically amongst all the other redactions. But that one, again, was kind of the most, I would say, controversial one and the most frustrating one for not only myself, but for everybody. And now we have a pie chart breakdown of all the different shapes that they're collecting. Couple ways to look at it. We've now gotten to a point where they have declassified the shapes, 
Why it was classified in the first place, I'm not sure. The UAP security classification guide may potentially play a role in that. Since all of that is uh, primarily redacted, it's kind of hard to tell. But they may have decided to declassify that aspect of UAP. Because remember, security classification guides can morph over time. That's why they have different versions. That's why they publish newer, uh, uh, again, uh, versions of, of these types of guides and so on. So I think that that's uh, an explanation there. Going back to my appeal, what will happen? Well, I'm hoping at this point they will declassify that part. So we will be able to see some of the information. Will that happen? Who knows? Uh, did that appeal and argument uh, that's happening through FOIA? And yes, those are legal challenges. It's not like we write emails and go for information because a lot of people, I think, um, minimize the importance of FOIA or the power of FOIA because they don't truly understand FOIA. Those arguments are legally sound. Uh, so when you have certain decisions made through FOIA, uh, things are altered in some cases. Things are declassified in other cases. So, and I've got lots of, of examples to, to show that, but that's essentially the power of the FOIA. And that will sometimes dictate what public affairs offices can say or what those experts say in an open hearing such as this. So how all that plays out, I'm not really sure, but it was pretty exciting to see because I think that once my appeal is finally done uh, somewhere in the year 2092, then we'll be able to go ahead and get a glimpse of what it was like in 2021. So I'm going to walk you through two cases that we've uh, declassified recently. Um, this first one is an MQ-9 in the Middle East observing that blow up, which is an apparent spherical object via EO sensors. Those are not IR. You'll see it uh, come through the top of the screen. There it goes. And then the camera will slew to follow it. You'll see it pop in and out of the field of view there. This is essentially all of the data we have associated with this event from some years ago. So why did it stop there? I published the entire video released by the Department of Defense. It pretty much echoes this or maybe some more frames. I didn't clock it. It wasn't important. But why there? Clearly, the MQ-9 was tracking this object, whatever it was. Call it a balloon. Call it an alien spacecraft for all I care. It was tracking it. So where's the rest? And that has been a question that has been asked on a lot of these UAP related imageries that have been released. Why is that it? And when you look at uh, going backwards, when you look at some of the other clips, same deal. They just kind of like stop abruptly. Well, going back to the FLIR, the gimbal and the go fast, they claim, meaning the U.S. Navy, that's it. Frame for frame. That's all they got. Well, now there's more of a structured way to collect UAP related evidence. So why does this one stop? Or did it? Is Arrow showing us everything? To reiterate the point, this is truly a unidentified object. Now, the general public was pretty much led to believe that, oh, this is all the data we have, and that's it. Well, I guarantee that's not all the data you have, because I bet you that video is longer. And if it's not, I'd love to know why. I hope somebody who gets to ask further questions asks that specific one. Why did this particular video end? Or is what happened after these frames here and this object was captured and tracked, is that classified? And I hope that somebody asks that. This particular uh, event, South Asia MQ-9, uh, looking at another MQ-9 and what's highlighted there in that red circle is an object that flies through the screen. Unlike the previous one, this one actually shows some really interesting things that everyone thought was truly anomalous to start with. First of all, it's a high-speed object that's flying in the field of regard of two MQ-9s. Second, it appears to have this uh, trail behind it, all right, which at first blush you would think that looks like a propulsion trail. In reality, uh, if you want to play the first slide, we'll show you what that looks like in real time, the first video. So we're looking at that. There it goes. Why don't you play it again and then pause it halfway through? Right there. All right, if you might be able to see that trail there behind it. That's actually not a real trail. That is a sensor artifact um, 
each one of those little blobs is actually a representation of the object as it's moving through. And later in the video, as the, as the uh, camera slews, that trail actually follows the direction of the camera, not the direction of the object. We pulled these apart frame by frame. We were able to demonstrate that that is essentially a readout uh, overlap of the image. It's a, it's a shadow image, right? It's not real. Further, if you later um, follow this all the way to end, it starts to resolve itself into that blob that's in that picture in the top left, right? And if you squint, it looks like an aircraft because it actually turns out to be an aircraft. Go if ahead you, and put that You on. gotta squint, remember to squint. So you'll see the tail sort of pop out there. And so what you're looking at is, this is in the infrared, this is the heat signature off of the engines of a commuter aircraft that happened to be flying in the vicinity of where those two MQ-9s were at. When you look at those videos and you compare them to the most recent UAP leaks, namely the Baghdad Phantom and the Mos Mosul Orb, Mosul Orb or Sphere, I don't know, forget which one he always chooses, but uh, the Mosul one. When you look at those, it's pretty much exactly what we're looking at here, but they're just different videos from different incidents. I don't know if there's a connection there, but it's an interesting, I would say, point to point out because when it comes to this one that we're looking at, the explained one, the phantom objects that we'll call them, like the Baghdad phantom, uh, I did a post on social media because everybody was saying that was an exhaust plume, or a lot of people, not everybody, but an exhaust plume. And I had recognized that the pixel length was almost identical. It was like a ghost image. Whether or not that played a role in calling it the Baghdad phantom, I have no idea. Uh, but regardless, what I did was I just layered every frame on top of each other, or excuse me, layered every frame, but showed that the actual object in the frame when put on the ghost-like image was exactly the same length. So it was like repeating data in each particular frame as it streaked ac uh, across. With the human eye, you put all that together, kind of looks like a, a trail of some kind or propulsion system, uh, but it actually isn't. So it was interesting to see this explanation because now here he's pulling in an identical characteristic to what leaked out, but this is not the leak. This is not the Baghdad Phantom. Same with the one that's unidentified. And I'm not sure what, if any strategy there would be to, to do that. Uh, but obviously from that pie chart, there was a lot of different objects that they've seen shape wise. So what are the odds that he just chose another sphere? Could just be by chance, could be that that's the majority of what they had or could declassify, who knows. Uh, but it was pretty close to the Mosul one that Jeremy Corbell had put out. And for those who do think it's the same, it is not. Uh, Jeremy also had posted on social media because he was being asked that it is not the same. So that being said, we've got two different videos nearly identical to the leaks. One explained, one not. Coincidence? Who knows? Just one of those weird things. How are we gonna get more data? We are working with the joint staff to issue guidance to all the services and commands that will then establish what are the reporting requirements, the timeliness, and all of the data that is required to be delivered to us and retained from all of the associated sensors. That historically hasn't been the case and it's been happenstance that data has been collected. Happenstance that data was collected What's interesting is, remember that slide before that I showed you guys back from 1955? They were saying the exact same thing about fine-tuning their data collection, this, that, and the other thing. Have they not learned anything from 1955, especially with all these other UFO programs and, and, and efforts to research UAP? I'll ask the question, then what have they been doing? Here's a list of them. The Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Application Program, or you hear me say OSAP, that was... Er again, controversial, 2008, but we'll call it 2007 based on reporting to 2012, more likely again, 2008. The Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, some say 2007, some say 2008, some say it's not a program at all. That's a whole different video in itself, but regardless, that lasted till about 2012, but wait, 
Luis Elizondo claimed 2017. Who to believe? I'll let you guys decide. But we're talking about a UAP program, according to Luis Elizondo and so on. So what were they doing? The UAP task force. Um, I put 2017 uh, as, as a question mark because there was... Uh, it wasn't the task force per se, but there was some kind of unofficial effort. The Pentagon has spoken to this before. So whether or not that had a name or they were calling it a task force or whatever, there was clearly something going on around that time frame. Officially established August 14, 2020 to 2021. The Airborne Object Identification and Management Synchronization Group, or AOIMSG, that was 2021 to 22. Then we got the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. That's what Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick heads right now. That's 2022 to present. Look at all those years and all those program efforts and all of those claims from past individuals. What were they doing? Did they not have any type of official anything to make sense of all of this over the years? Let's just settle on the fact they were doing this in their free time, and it was 5% of what they did. OK, let's let's just say we believe everybody at their word, uh, but it was a minor part of their work in the government. All of that's fine. But still, over all that time, we don't have any structured program. And that's what bothers me about this is that that, that doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. Nothing makes sense about this timeline and all of these efforts when put on a timeline and the claims that people have said nothing. Now, that doesn't mean they're lying or Kirkpatrick's lying or they all could be lying for all I know. But regardless, it just doesn't make sense. Efforts can be fine tuned. Efforts can be misdirected. Uh, uh, you can have change of direction. That's fine. But these are basic things that go back to 1955 at least. And they're saying the exact same thing. Doesn't anybody else think that that's just bizarre? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yet that's the reality of what's put in front of us. Now, there's a lot of other things, too, that if you pay attention and put it on the timeline, doesn't make sense. This was an article I wrote in 2019, and I first want to give a shout out and credit to Brian Bender, then at Politico magazine, who had reported on a uh, UFO reporting guideline that was, was issued by the U.S. Navy, and then he reported uh, around the 2019 time frame, maybe 2018, that that guideline was being kind of updated and reissued. It was currently in dra it was at that time in draft form. I went after it and found out it went from draft to issued. So again, this is a quick note for FOIA people. Draft documents are incredibly hard to get through FOIA. It's not impossible, but they hide behind FOIA exemption B5 a lot. So the minute I got in writing a statement that it was no longer draft, I went and filed a case for it, and it was 100% classified. So again, I wrote that uh, story in 2019. But what are these guidelines? What did that stipulate? Were the guidelines on how to collect the data, report the data? If not, why not? Because this was around the time frame when it was reissued, and again, that 2019 uh, time frame, you go backwards to this slide, you're in the middle of the unofficial effort that led into the UAP task force around this time. So obviously there was an effort that we can, that we can kind of fall back on here when Arrow takes over that they could look at and pull information from, pull guidelines, pull structure, pull procedure, pull protocol, pull something that us taxpayers paid for, but nothing. It's like they're starting fresh. Now, maybe that was needed. Who knows? And if so, why? Why, after all these years of investigating through OSAP and ATIP and UAPTF, all getting money and having certain individuals heading those programs, that we have nothing that we could give to Arrow and go, okay, here's the head start. We spent X amount of millions of dollars. Here you go. Nothing? One of my favorite stories in, in my history of looking into UFOs is the story of the Air Force Manual Instruction 10-206. You can see this one was in 2008. So we're going back, and this was one of the latter versions. I found this back in about 1999 to 2000, I think it was, and watched it be revised from about 2000 to, again, 2008. And Chapter 5 was talking about these surveys reports and how they uh, reported unidentified flying objects or UFOs. 
This was uh, essentially a, a mandated instruction, not essentially, it was a mandated instruction that all U.S. Air Force pilots were to follow. All of those UFO reports went to NORAD. So this essentially predated OSAP, ATIP, UAPTF, AERO, AOIMSG, whatever the acronym, predated all of that. So what happened to all of this policy procedure and all of the service reports that went to NORAD? Now, NORAD, by the way, is not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, so I can't touch what was made under this. But are you telling me throughout everything that they got through this, there was nothing that they could use for Aero? None of that makes sense. Now, uh, the report in January basically said about half of the ones at that time, about 150, were balloon, were likely balloon-like or something like that. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean they're resolved. Oh, I see. Okay, so what, uh, let me, let me walk everyone through what our analytic process looks like. We have a, essentially a five step process, right? So we have, we get our cases in with all the data. We create a case uh, for that uh, event. My team does a preliminary scrub of all of those cases as they come in just to sort out do we have any information that says this is in one of those likely categories it's likely a balloon it's likely a balloon you know a bird it's likely some other object or we don't know then we prioritize those based off of where they are are they attached to a national security area does it show some anomalous um, phenomenology that is of interest? If it's just if it's just a spherical thing that's floating around with the with the wind and it has no payload on it, that's going to be less important than something that has a payload on it, which will be less important than something that's maneuvering, right? So there's there's sort of a hierarchy of just binning the priorities because we can't do all of them at once. Once we do that and we prioritize them, we take that package of data in that case, and I have set up two teams. Uh, Think of this as a red team, blue team, or a competitive analysis. I have an intelligence community team made up of intelligence analysts, and I have an S&T team made up of scientists and engineers and the people that actually build a lot of these sensors or physicists, because, you know, if you're a physicist, you can do anything, right? Um, And... But they're not associated with the uh, intel community. They're, they're not intel officers. So they, they look at this through the lens of the sensor of, the, of the, what the data says. We give that package to both teams. And the intelligence community is going to look at it through the lens of the intelligence record and, and what they assess and their intel tradecraft, which they have very specific rules and regulations on how they do that. Scientific community, technical community is going to look at it through the lens of what is the data telling me what is the sensor doing? What would I expect a sensor response to be? And back that out. Those two groups give us their answers. We then adjudicate. If they agree, then I am more likely to close that case if they agree on what it is. If they disagree, we will have an adjudication. We'll bring them together. We'll take a look at the differences. We'll adjudicate what, why do you say one thing and you say another. We will then come to a case um, recommendation. That'll get written up by my team. That then goes to a senior technical advisory group, which is outside of all of those people, made up of senior technical folks and and, uh, um, intel analysts and operators from uh, retired uh, out of the community. Uh, And they they essentially peer review what that case recommendation is. They write their recommendations. That comes back to me. I review it. We make a determination, and I'll sign off one way or the other. And then that will go out as the the case determination. Once we have an approved web portal to hang, the unclassified stuff, we we will downgrade and declassify things and put it out there. In the meantime, we're putting a lot of these on our classified web portal where we can then collaborate with the rest of the community so they can see what's going on. You know I'm going after a screenshot of that classified web portal. They have plans on doing a public one. Uh, Cool. Uh, And you'll learn here, I, I think I 
got the clip now i'm second guessing myself but you'll learn that they have tried to do a public one and submitted drafts for that uh but again that that uh, stone wall is for me through foy is going to be the uh draft part of it but he just confirmed there's a classified one and a lot of times as long as there's no classified data being shown within that portal you can actually get copies of the portal itself so i'm actually going for that as well um it was a longer clip to show a little bit tedious at times, but I think it's important because to his credit, he's at least got a structure. He's at least trying to figure out ways to solve these cases. So I wanted to put that clip in there as credit to him that there is this process that seems, I'm not a scientist, but seems very scientifically structured uh, with a lot of minds involved. Although he didn't say this specifically, but when you have one mind involved, um, investigating a case you may have a bias within it but what he has set up is this team a versus team v b scenario where you potentially have the inability to be biased where you have two different backgrounds if they agree then you know you're on the right track if they disagree they collectively come together and talk it out uh that that seems pretty structured to me so to his credit i think that that was very much worth pointing out so of those over 650 you know we've prioritized about uh, half of them to be of, of um, anomalous, interesting value. And now we have to go through those and go, how much do I have actual data for? Because if all I have is a, is a operator report that says I saw X, Y, or Z, my assessment is A, B, or C, that's not really sufficient. That's a good place to start, but I have to have data. I have to have radar data. I have to have EO data. I have to have thermal data. I have to have overhead data. And we need to look at all that. Yes, you do. So hopefully he's getting that. But for me, the key part of this was over half of them exhibited some type of, you know, peaked interest here for either him or his team. Uh, that's still a sizable number. Half of 650 is 325 my math's correct, but you're talking about a, a sizable number. I understand his uh, essentially concern about the lack of data for some, but at least that gives us some kind of indicator on what is piquing his interest. Of the, of the cases that are showing it, you know, some sort of advanced technical signature, of which we're talking single percentages of the entire population of cases we have, um, I am concerned about what that nexus is, and I have indicators that some are related to foreign capabilities. We have to investigate that with our IC partners, and as we get evidence to support that, that gets then handed off to the appropriate IC agency to investigate. Again, it becomes an SEP at that point. There's that SCP again. But this is, again, a broad stroke note. Why wasn't this kind of stuff set up already? I saw the news headlines that their instrumentation wasn't calibrated for certain types of objects, which is why they missed those balloons. But come on, you're telling me that all the NRO satellites, uh, all of the NASA instrumentation, all of NORAD's capabilities, they weren't seeing unknown objects, what, whatever that unknown is, and there wasn't a procedure to make it somebody else's problem or make it their own problem. This is kind of like concerning. If you really look into it, it doesn't really make sense that all of a sudden this, and again, not to demean Dr. Kirkpatrick's effort here, but a very small effort at this point, a very new effort is trying to make sense of what they consider unknown objects, which very well may be earth-based, and, and explainable. But my whole point is it's like he's starting from scratch to figure this all out and essentially make it somebody else's problem. No wonder they're saying it's a huge national security risk because it is. That's ridiculous that those types of things aren't worked out. He threw in the single percentages again. So just to throw back to this uh, screen here, the unknown 9% obviously echoes the exact same conclusions that they were seeing statistically in 1955. But somebody is dropping the ball. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, Congress has mandated that your office establish a discoverable and accessible electronic method for potential witnesses of UAP incidents and potential participants 
in government UAP related activities to contact your office and tell their stories. Congress also set up a process whereby people uh, subject to non-disclosure agreements, preventing them from disclosing what they may have witnessed or participated in, could tell you what they know without risk of retribution from the, or violation of their NDAs. Um, have you submitted a public-facing website product for approval to your superiors, and how long has it been under review? I have. Uh, we submitted the first version of that uh, before Christmas. And do you have an estimate from them when they will respond and when you'll have feedback on that? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, we will author a letter asking for that timely response. He definitely didn't seem happy about that, but before Christmas, he submits that essential draft template for them uh, in this public facing website and nothing is approved here by late April of the next year. I know the government takes a lot of time, but if this was a priority of any kind, uh, it would, you would think, become a priority to just get it approved. The classified version obviously already was, so why not a public version? <clears throat> to your superiors, uh, when when do you expect that you will establish a public-facing discoverable um, and access portal for people to use to contact your office as the law requires? So I would like to first say thank you all very much for um, referring the witnesses that you have thus far to us. I appreciate that. We've brought in uh, nearly two dozen so far. It's been, it's been very uh, helpful. I'd ask that you continue to do that until we have an approved plan. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a multi-phased approach for doing that, that we've been uh, uh, socializing and have submitted for uh, approval sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, once that happens, then we should be able to push all that out and get, uh, get this a little more automated. Great. Um, what I would ask, though, is as you all continue to uh, refer to us and uh, refer witnesses to us, I'd, I'd appreciate if you do that. Um, please try to prioritize the ones that you want to do because we do have a small uh, research staff. Yep. So small research staff. And they can't obviously interview or do everything that is put on their desk. So he's asking uh, essentially these senators to prioritize the witnesses that they should interview. But I'm curious who's going to the senators. And I'm curious after they've gone to the now nearly two dozen. So you would think that the ones that are the highest priority at this point, Gillibrand or whomever else would have thrown them Arrow's direction by now, that none of them were credible to support any of these more outlandish and I say outlandish, but I, and I, I don't really mean it to sound as disrespectful as that. Um, but those stories that we have seen being alluded to and some claims actually being made, all of the above, I would think that senators, if they're intrigued enough to say, Arrow, you should look at this Dr. Eric Davis guy because he allegedly met with Thomas Wilson. Uh, this was submitted to the congressional record. So, you know, tick tock, let's let's get on it. You would think that that would be done by now. You would think that if uh, um, in the first hearing Jeremy Corbell's name came up, you would think that Bob Lazar would kind of come along with that because not only did Corbell have the leaks that were mentioned, even though Bob Lazar was not, you know somehow if somebody's talking to Corbell and he really thinks that Bob Lazar is telling the truth, that that's going to go across their desk too. So would that be thrown Arrow's direction? Again, some of that is just speculation and assumptions, but I would think so. Because the senators aren't going to do the research. They're going to hear these stories by, in some cases, what they consider cred by credible people, they think anyway. And then it goes to Arrow for research. So does Arrow have transcripts of any of those guys? Who knows? But I'm going for it. Do you have any uh, plans for public engagement that you want to share now that you think it's important that the public knows what the plan is? So we have a... Uh, uh a number of public engagement uh, recommendations uh, according to our strategic plan. Um, all of those have been submitted for approval. They have to be approved by USDINS. Um, we are waiting for approval to go do that. Okay, I will follow up on that. So it seems like he's waiting for a lot uh, for approvals and so on and so forth. So we'll see what the senators do, namely Gillibrand, who will write these letters. By the way, 
congressional correspondence is FOIAable. So I will be going for all of the correspondence. Obviously, you don't file the day after. You got to give her some time. Uh, she's uh, obviously got a lot on her plate, but you give it some kind of um, lead time for her to actually write the letter, then go after it. And I have done that in the past. You can go for congressional correspondence logs, see what other senators may have written letters in regards to UAP to try and get the DOD to do X, Y, Z, whatever that might be. So obviously all of these things that are talked about become paper trails or future paper trails like this one that will uh, hopefully be a paper trail sooner rather than later. There was a question here from the chat room for those watching live. Black Dread Scotland, always good to see you here. Thank you for that support. Do you think that many of the unknowns are U.S. recon platforms such as airships, balloons, drones, and EWC, and the reason why they're unknown is because they are classified U.S. assets? I'm taking your question that maybe Dr. Kirkpatrick doesn't have access to everything. That could very well be true. Um, but it really does sound like what they're focusing on when it comes to the unknowns or things that they have verified to essentially not be our own. Um, again, that's a little bit of speculation, so I'm not saying that he said that outright, but I, I'm kind of leaning towards that, that I would think that there's some kind of filter before it's sent for Arrow, because I don't envision Arrow just searching the entire catalog for the U.S. military infrastructure looking for UAP. I would imagine that when it comes to those classified platforms that may be connected to UAP, um, you know, they, they wouldn't cross his desk. But if that pl platform is seen by someone else who isn't read in, they're not cleared, a pilot seems to see something. Sure. And that begs the question, does Kirkpatrick have access to everything? Uh, that's a, a purely speculative area of all of this. So if I understood you right, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer from that or for that, I should say. But um, sadly, we just don't know. We, we have no idea what he does and does not have access to. Um, I would also imagine, too, that they may instruct him to, let's say, not release a certain video. Um, and again, this is also speculation, but let's say his office says this particular video is unidentified. So they're going to declassify it, release it as an example like they have in the past. But it turns out that it's some classified platform from some other military branch or so on. I would think before he got approval to release that material, uh, they would shut that down because he obviously has a clearance himself. So they may read him in and go, that's not something we're letting out in the open. The approval wouldn't go in. And then it may even just disappear in his databases and books. I, I think that that's a possibility, too. So then it's not even a consideration for Arrow. So a lot of speculation there. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I don't know the right answer. Because uh, obviously we're getting into a classified territory. But what my impression was from what he said, that we're not dealing with uh, the classified U.S. assets that he's deeming as unidentified. Um, and then my last question is about um, <clears throat> the integration of departments, UAP operations, research analysis, and strategic communications. Um, during the recent UAP incidents over North America, it didn't appear that you were allowed to play that role. Um, do you agree that the public perception is generally that you and your office did not appear to play a major role in the department's response to the detection of objects over North America? Uh, what can you tell us um, that's going on behind the scenes from your perspective? And in the after action assessment process, is there awareness that there is a need to operate differently in the future and a commitment to doing so? When the, when the objects were first detected, I got called by joint staff leadership uh, to come in uh, late one night to review uh, events as they were unfo unfolding and to give them a, a, you know, an assessment uh, based on what we knew at that time. Uh, I did that, uh, worked with uh, the director of joint staff, the J2 and the J3 uh, that night and over the couple of following days on what are the types of things that we are tracking from an unidentified object perspective? What databases do we use? Those sorts of things for, for, norm, for known objects, known tracking. Um, beyond that, the response, I would, have to, I would have to refer you back to the White House for the decision on how they did the, the response. Uh, we did not play a role in what you would respond other than that initial um, 
you know, advice on what we are seeing and how we are seeing it. Yet again, it kind of was concerning to hear that Arrow was the office they called once these these objects that from what we were told as the general public, they knew about prior these balloons that arrow was who they went to. That's not to demean arrow as an office, but why were there no other policies or procedures to take over for when they saw known foreign technology spy or otherwise, but any type of foreign technology coming in. If I recall, weren't we told that they had known about this days or weeks prior to it becoming public knowledge and us tracking these balloons and so on, uh, there's nothing. So then they call the Arrow office. I think it's great that they were called in as maybe a consultant role, but it, I kind of got the impression that they were the ones that everyone called, like call Arrow uh, with these balloon objects. And it just surprised me that there was no other effort that had been well established at this point to have policy and procedure on what to do. The other weird thing is the fact that we started shooting these things down, starting with the Chinese spy balloon, but then within days you had multiple objects shot down, all rumored to be, you know, balloons or whatever. Uh, and then like nothing, like it all just stopped. So what are the odds that all of a sudden we, we see the balloon, uh, the first one, and we shoot that down. And then there's these beautiful photographs. They really were cool. I, I think that they were awesome nighttime shots of them collecting the wreckage and essentially posing with it. Um, there was that. Then nothing on the other objects that were shot down. We just heard about them. So in the course of days, you had all these objects shot down. And then all of a sudden, nothing. No news stories. No additional shoot downs that we're aware of. No anything. What happened? You know, and that's what's what's really fascinating to me because I don't have an answer. I, I'm not going to pretend I do. But but at what point does some of this become strategic? Because in my view, those incidents were tied into the UAP, UAP topic. So some of the stories that I saw were tying it into Arrow's effort and UAP and and so on and so forth, essentially taking the mystery out and putting an explanation in. So the general public doesn't that doesn't do what you or I do make these videos or watch these videos or really stay involved in the conversation. They see that mere mention of, yeah, the UAP conversation. Well, it looks like a lot of it is balloons. I think the New York Times had a very similar similar tone to their most recent. All of a sudden, the majority of the general public, what do they do? They lose interest. And consequently, who else loses interest? The senators go back to that, you know, empty room that we saw. Uh, when it came to the interest from the Senate side, that nobody was there. Sure, people want to think, oh, well, you know what? Uh, they were all at the classified setting. So there were really no reasons for them to go to the public hearing because they heard everything. Well, if that's true, read into that, because then they're not there for you. They're there for them. They're not there to inform you of anything. They're in what? a meeting and they move on. They don't care about what you and I have to say. Why? Because I think the general public is starting to lose interest and that's the result. I think we need to have efforts that keep senators in the understanding that the general public wants to know. They do, they really do. But the problem is they hear too much BS. Full stop. From the mainstream media, it is ridiculous. There was a, a mainstream outlet that ran a story on the UFO video that we already went through from the hearing, and it was the sphere, right? So that was the one that, that was truly unknown. The other one was an aircraft. And so they had this flashy headline about releasing a new UFO video, so on and so forth. They showed the wrong video. There's like nothing serious about the coverage when it comes to mainstream media on this topic anymore. And that's the problem. So the public is hearing BS. They really are. And I think that that's what we need to ensure is not how we all end up. That people that are making claims out there of uh, leaked classified information and alien tech and people with these outlandish claims, as I said in the beginning of this deep dive, it is important to either put up or shut up. And I really, truly believe we need to get into that mindset that people shouldn't be afraid to call others out when they aren't taking the care that they can. 
I think that that um, I want to be careful here because I don't want to be disrespectful. But at the end of the hearing, there's a video that had surfaced where uh, Senator Gillibrand, I think, was given ancient alien pamphlets or, or, or something to that effect. Now, I want to stress, I'm not trying to sound disrespectful here, but is that what she needs to see show up to the hearing? I'm going to get hate mail for saying that. But is that what we are going to present her with? Is that the voice of the people? And I, and I would say no. I would say that, that, that convincing someone to put the Wilson Davis document in there was not the right path. But you know what? Throw them under oath and put them in there now. I changed my mind. I thought that was the biggest facepalm moment from that first hearing. But you know what? It's done and over. So put them under oath. See what happens. See if Dr. Eric Davis will sit in there with protection under oath and tell everybody on the committee, yes, I wrote those notes uh, and everything I wrote actually happened. I'd love to see it. And if Thomas Wilson denies it under oath, are you guys going to believe it? And that's obviously asked towards those that, that believe that the Wilson documents depict actual events. So you have, I think, a certain angle of information that be, should be presented to senators. I don't believe the Wilson Davis documents and the Bob Lazar like stories are the way to go or ancient aliens. I just don't. And that's unfortunate, but that's where we're going. And in that process, we're now seeing the degradation of this topic. I'll get some hate mail for that too. I'm sure I will, but we're seeing heavily classified um, blankets being put over all of this. But as a result, you have an influx of people claiming they know what's going on. And there's so much bunk out there. The general public loses interest trying to keep track of it all because that's what the, the few now mainstream media outlets that are doing stories are highlighting the ridiculously outlandish claims that hold no evidence whatsoever that they'll quote 72 anonymous sources in one particular article and back that up with absolutely nothing. And that's what gets some headlines on some British tabloid papers. Well, to you and I, we can sit here and talk about it and, and have fun doing so and respectfully disagree. I always dig that. But sadly, to the general public, they're going to lose interest if they haven't started already. And I think we're seeing that the Baghdad phantom. Remember when I when I said that there was just a surprisingly lack of coverage to that? And I think that's a repercussion of all this. That's actually a really interesting story, whether or not it's an alien probe, who knows? But regardless, MQ9 Reaper footage is being leaked. That's classified, which I can prove is is a classified video in nature inherently because it was shot by the MQ9, regardless of what the object is. And it's leaked out. That to me is the story. Who is on the inside leaking classified information and seemingly getting away with it and doing it for years? Just in the last 60 days, 45 days of that, a DOD leak sparked a huge investigation, major public affairs outreach and damage control. And I believe the guy was already arrested and charged. What's going on with the UAP world? No one cares. Come on. So this is what's weird and intriguing to me is that there's all these unanswered questions, but it seems like the focus is way over here when it actually should be right here. People are missing all of these major things. And in the end, senators are handed ancient alien things and Wilson Davis somehow gets uh, traction within a, a, a congressional hearing. And that's what's unfortunate because there's so much more, I think, evidence to be presented. And and I, I still don't know if Kirkpatrick has the access that he needs. If you were to ask me to bet a dollar, I would bet a dollar he does not. I believe that Arrow is too much in the spotlight to have access to, to everything. I, would, I believe that the secrecy proves there is much more to this than clutter and balloons and UASs like Dr. Kirkpatrick had stated. So when I go back to the very beginning of this deep dive and say that it seemed forced, was it really forced? Was he, is he the guy to go out there and explain this? 
not investigate it. No, I'm not making that conspiracy claim. And no, I'm not saying he's lying. But we do have to question whether or not he has access to all of the information. Now, throughout this video presentation, I kept showing you slides from 1955 of uh, the same document, but just different sections of it showing how it compares to present day. So I'll close with this thought. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, the main chief consultant scientist for Project Blue Book, started in very much a similar way. The majority of everything was explainable. He was the swamp gas guy. And Dr. Hynek was very much the skeptic slash debunker of Project Blue Book. Very similar to what we're seeing today. Go back to the clips of Dr. Kirkpatrick saying the majority of everything is all explainable. Clutter, balloons, UASs. Very similar to Dr. J. Allen Hynek. But as time went on, Hynek was really a scientist. And he looked at all of that evidence and he looked at those cases. And there is documented proof that he wanted to actually reopen some of the cases that were solved. I have the letters on the blackvault.com. They're fascinating. And uh, just search for a section called From the Desk of Project Blue Book. It's a fascinating story, including uh, actual written letters from Dr. J. Allen Hynek to Hector Quintanilla, head of Project Blue Book at the time, and essentially arguing that some cases should be reopened and the U.S. Air Force, with the um, uh, direction of Quintanilla, said, no, they're going to stay closed. So at what point does Kirkpatrick have access and how much does he not? How much is he forced to do something uh, or how much is he not? These are all juxtapositions that are absolutely fascinating when you, um, when you look and compare how strikingly similar it really is. So where does John, uh, Sean Kirkpatrick go from here? I don't know, but it'll be fascinating to see because if there is, and this was speculation on whether or not he was really kind of forced to explain these things, that is exactly what happened during Project Blue Book. Now we're talking about academic institutions coming along. That is exactly what happened in Project Blue Book. And when you're talking about these peer reviewed processes, that's kind of kind of what happened during Project Blue Book. But in the end, the academic community looked at the evidence that were brought in and appropriately cleared, and they said, shut it all down. It's not worth it. So are we on the same path or not? Your guess is as good as mine. As always, these deep dives, I understand, are not for everybody. But if you're still here, A for effort on your dedication. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, the YouTube channel obviously has a big comment section. Please feel free to post your comments below. A thumbs up is definitely a help to me. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And above all else, sharing the channel name and link to the channel is the biggest help of all. If you feel so inclined to support the channel, you want to throw in a dollar or five dollars or whatever, I have a Patreon. You can do either the Super Chats if you're watching live, or there are ways to do comments on YouTube where you can tip as well. Um, I'm not looking to take your money. 100% of what you submit goes to the Freedom of Information Act cases that I file and the costs to run the blackvault.com, now totaling more than 32 million pages over the course of 26 years that I've added, which are housed on three dedicated servers. And so sadly, it's just not cheap. Uh, so 100% of what you guys send in goes to that. I don't buy myself a steak dinner or a coffee or anything like that. Um, that said, thank you so much for listening and watching. And this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. And we'll see you next time. All right, man, I, I went through it. All right, so obviously you guys are watching the behind the scenes version. That'll be clipped and then the opening gra or the closing graphics go. Uh, hopefully that was interesting to you. I know that that was um, actually not as long as I thought. I would have thought I'd hit two hours, so thankfully I did not. I didn't see any questions uh, other than the ones that I pulled in, the one or two that I pulled in um, come in. I'm happy to hang out here for another couple minutes. Uh, if you guys do have, for those that have stayed this long or are joining me now, I'm happy to, to just do some uh, extra questions and time for you if you'd like. Um, if you can, all capitals is a big help from here on out. I'll try and scroll up a little bit, but it pulls in, my screen pulls in comments from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 
Uh, so if you're watching on any of those platforms, feel free to comment or do it now. Um, and I will definitely get to it. Adam, I saw your question. And first off, thank you. It was a great question. I felt that I may mentally get off track and I didn't want to, but I'll bring it up now. Uh, can you bring up the sentient stuff that NRO was forced to disclose via FOIA? They have a sophisticated system that Arrow had to ask them to turn on. So, yeah, this was a very interesting story. For those who don't know, I, I have a video on this channel as well. Essentially, what, what it was was a classified platform with the National Reconnaissance Office uh, that essentially was detecting a tic-tac-like object uh, that they deemed a UAP. The majority of it was all redacted, uh, but it was discovered through those documents that there's some kind of program or capability on board that allowed them to see these UAP, whatever they were, and it needed to be turned on. And it was a really interesting aspect to this particular release because what was it that was on board that needed to be turned on? Uh, number two, why was it off? Uh, but number three, how many more were there? So I had published those documents and uh, put those out there, but also subsequently filed additional cases to see if they if that particular system saw anything else and uh, still waiting for, for the responses on that. But that's only a couple months, so not too long, sadly, in the grander scheme. But yeah, it was a, a great question, Adam. Um, connecting it to Arrow, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that that information is 100% shared with Arrow. I mean, I would assume that they're cleared. NRO was mentioned in the UAP report itself as being a contributing agency. So so clearly they're 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 sending data of some kind. And my guess it would be not only the sentient information but uh you know probably other satellite systems as well, other capability platforms that they have, uh likely even ones we're not even aware of. Hopefully that information and data is going over to Kirkpatrick for for analysis. But yeah, great question. Um Jay, you're the best. John Greenwald is the goat. Been bringing the documentation for decades. I appreciate that. My nine-year-old would uh, argue and say Cristiano Ronaldo is the goat. Uh, he always he always says goat now. So whenever I hear that, I always think of him. But uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Jay. Uh, scrolling down here. Feel free to add those questions to the chat. I'll try and scroll down here. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, sir. Thank you, Stu Studio 1010. Glad to have you here. I really appreciate it. LJ, great question. Is there a public record of who attended the classified version of the Arrow briefing? As far as I'm aware, as I'm recording this, no. Um, I really don't have any strong connections to that uh, committee, any staffers or anything like that. Um, I just don't really hit those committees a lot with questions, so I don't really have good contacts. So there might be somebody else out there that has uh, either published something, I just haven't seen it, or they're asking. Uh, my guess is they would not divulge it uh, for whatever reason. Um, just, just usually Congress is kind of tight-lipped, the Senate is tight-lipped about all that, um, especially in a classified setting, who's there, who, who isn't, so on and so forth. Again, it's not to say that they won't release it or even they haven't already, I just haven't seen it. The, I love this thought. The mark of an educated mind is to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I, I love that. Django Fandango, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I mean, that's a, a great point because I, one of the things that I love to do with this channel, uh, not only with this video, but, but elsewhere as well, is to bring as much information as I can to you. It doesn't mean that I endorse uh, all of it, but I, you know, source as much as I can and, and explore as much as I can for all of you to kind of get that information as well. So I think you've really articulated uh, something that um, is kind of the, 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 the direction of this channel and, and how I've wanted to take it. The mark of an educated mind is to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. We should never be afraid to challenge our beliefs. So well said, fully agree with you. Do you think the government actually has any recovered alien technology that's a tough one. I mean, I'm, I'm the type of person that needs to see to believe. If they do, I don't think FOIA is going to bring it out. I do believe that it would be a highly classified piece of knowledge, um, that, that there would be security protocols that would safeguard from that. 
And that leads me to the problem I've had with quote unquote whistleblowers like Bob Lazar that come out with these outlandish stories that they worked on alien tech, this, that, and the other thing, you know that that would be highly classified. So now all of a sudden he just gets to run around and do conferences and sell t-shirts. Doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it's, it's, it, there's a problem with it. The biggest the biggest pushback that I get by saying that about Lazar is that if they went after him, they would admit everything that he said is true. And that is provably not a valid argument. Gary McKinnon is a prime example of just that. Gary McKinnon is the guy who hacked NASA. He hacked NASA and claims that he found all of this evidence that, that essentially, um, was about secret space programs, people in space, uh, alien technology. I forget all of exactly what his claims were, but this came about years and years ago. Um, stories lived on. I think it'll live on for quite some time, but that was his, that was his story. Obviously all classified information. The government has gone after him for hacking NASA computers. That does not mean that what he saw was true. The same with Lazar. They could go after him by never admitting what he said was true, but rather in some way was a violation of his oath somewhere. They wouldn't even have to tell you. So it's not validation if they if they try and go after somebody. And by the way, uh, I've gone after Gary McKinnon's essentially the, his records, like the, the case files within NASA to prove uh, that he did this. And they still consider as of like two years ago, they still consider the case open, even though they denied extradition. Uh, they still consider the case open, so they deny any material on Gary McKinnon and what he did under FOIA exemption B7 because it is a ongoing law enforcement uh, investigation. And I've talked to Gary only a couple times over the last few years. Um, I wanted to get him in on this channel. I think I'll revive that effort. We, we just could never figure out a time that worked for both of us. Um, which is a shame, but even though I don't know what to think of his story, going back to that previous comment, um, it would be nice to, 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 to get him on. So back to this, so away from McKinnon. So I wanted to kind of prove my point there about the problem with alien technology and those that have claimed we have it. I don't see any credible evidence at this point to support it. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, it just means why I believe what I do. I'm the type of person that needs to see to believe. Um, I think that's something that would definitely be denied via FOIA. I think it's highly classified. And those that have come out claiming such stories, I think that the fact that they've done that hurts, in my book, in my opinion, hurts that confirmation even more. Because I wish there wasn't so much bunk that went along with, with speculating on whether or not they have it. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality to it. That doesn't mean my way is the right way to think about it, but just for me, I don't know. I, I mean, that's, that's the short way to, to, to answer your question. I, I wish there was more supporting evidence for me. There's just not. If this was time travel stuff, could that be a big top secret? Um, I mean, I would imagine getting a little bit out of my, my neck of the woods there on, uh, speculation, but always a, a possibility. I'm, I just don't do the, the time travel angle. What piece of evidence documentation would you hand over to Gillibrand slash Kirkpatrick if you could? Well, uh, that's a great question. I, I mean, that's one I think that I would love to plan. Maybe I should do that for kind of a fun future video is to do like a X amount of minute presentation on, on what some of the best stuff from my side that I've seen. Um, actually, is that is that Dan? Hey, Dan. Uh, I didn't. I, I I apologize if I'm wrong. Hey, look over there. I think that that's uh, Dan Warren, who I mentioned early in the thing. If I'm totally wrong and that's not Dan, I apologize to you. But I think that that's him. Um, so so going back to your question, I, I think that one of the things that sticks out to me that doesn't get a whole lot of play is there is CIA documentation to support that that even though we're going back to the 1970s that there was material connected to UAP slash UFOs uh, that was physically in the offices of the CIA. The documentation related to that has been lost or destroyed. We have a partially redacted document to show that the CIA at one time anyway, 
was seeing this type of material. We can read that. That's you and me and the general public. To me, that's, that's, that's probably a small percentage of what's really there. We know a lot of CIA material was lost or destroyed, or at least that that's what they tell us. Um, but what else is there? And even though he may, meaning Sean Kirkpatrick, may very much tread into classified territory, I think that there's enough evidence in the CIA holdings that has been released to warrant some kind of line of questioning to say, hey, there's physical material that you guys either have or had at one point. Um, what is that? What did you guys determine? Um, I, I think that that's um, something that really needs to be explored. It's hard to because to answer your question, sometimes you need to go back into history and that might not be something he wants to do simply because you do have the overall secrecy where these documents have been lost or, or destroyed. So if the CIA is truly being honest, the easy out for that agency is to say, look, we've looked for past requesters. Yeah, well, that's all we've got. Sorry. And Kirkpat Kirkpatrick's mindset uh, is essentially that he uh, really can't do anything with that, that he needs that radar data. He needs all that imagery available. And essentially you're talking about modern day pieces of equipment. So for his angle, he needs to have this most recent material, you know, the, of the cutting edge tech of 2023 at his disposal, not going back decades ago. So for, for someone like me, it's hard to answer that just, just because, you do have to go back in history and I understand what he's looking for and rightfully so as, as a scientist in this effort that those documents don't really do it for him. Uh, but they do it for, for me because it shows that there is a solid history here of physical material that the intelligence community has had, but also uh, sightings and cases that have defied the technology of that day. So you have their instances of craft going faster than anything we had as humans. And even though for Kirkpatrick, that's not going to be very helpful uh, for all of us. What we have to do is look back and say, wow, and I'm, I'm just making this year up. But wow, 1957, this craft did this four times as fast as the known aircraft of the time. And you would think we would have passed that point from the 50s to now, where if it was a classified platform, we'd hear about it by now. And yet the opposite is true. The CIA has tried to do that and attribute the U-2 to some of the 1950s flights. So essentially saying, look, what was otherworldly or what was fast or what uh, too high or whatever the characteristic was, well, that was us. So the U-2 is declassified now, so we can take credit for that. And the CIA did that many years ago on in a tweet uh, that they said, you remember the UFOs of the 1950s, that was us, and essentially said that it was the U-2. But when you look at the actual facts and data, uh, 19, I think it was 55 was the first flight of the U-2. Uh, so you had immediately cut out about half the decade. And then from 1955 on, there was no flights that were really attributed to any famous UFO case that I'm aware of. So my whole point being is that even though it may not be in interesting to Kirkpatrick's effort now, I think there's a lot of evidence to support their uh, being further effort by Kirkpatrick. I hope that that made sense. Um, I just don't think when you get into history, he's going to get the satisfaction unless the CIA is lying and that they still have that material. So I think it's still worth a knock on the door for, for him. If you had to bet a dollar, would you bet that the U S government is in possession of alien craft and bodies? I think I kind of covered that already, uh, but I will bet a dollar and double down on my, my last answer. Uh, if you weren't here from that, feel free to, uh, to, to rewind. But I, I, I think I covered that. James G you can tell Kirkpatrick don't want this job. I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe he just doesn't want it. From what I've heard, he he has an interest in this. Uh, I was surprised that it was as watered down as it was just based on, you know, some of that rumor and speculation to what Kirkpatrick believes. So, you know, you can look at it a couple ways. But yeah, no matter what, it, it looked forced and uncomfortable, right? And whether or not that was intentionally forced, he just didn't look like he wanted to be there. Um, maybe not necessarily doesn't want the job. He just didn't look like he wanted to be there. Um, but also in fairness to him, 
think the classified briefing was what an hour and a half or so. Um, so with that said, I mean, he had already maybe answered and talked for an hour and a half and it, you know, just is tired. So he's just like getting through the, the scripted reading and, you know, although to us it's monotone cause that's our lead in. He had already been talking to the committee prior for 90 plus minutes. So I always try and be fair, but uh, forced is a good way to put it. Why do you think the public aren't included in the circulation of reported UAP? Your guess is as good as mine. One thing that I didn't say in the, the presentation, but I'll, I'll say quickly now is that if there really is a lot of these objects that are balloons, clutter, and so on, Kirkpatrick proved that they can sanitize even classified MQ-9 footage. And by sanitizing, I mean they blur out all of the data that's on screen, all of that information that, yeah, would be useful to us, but I understand. Maybe they don't want us to know where it was shot or when or whatever. So you blur all that. You essentially sanitize the video for public release. So it has no metadata embedded inside the video file, but also on top of that, everything is kind of sanitized. He proved he can do that. And, and yet through legal ways, with the US Navy specifically, and now the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense Joint Chiefs did the same exact thing. I went after all videos deemed UAP uh, and they denied them all. They said that they were all classified and I lost the appeal to the US Navy. Um, in plain English, that means they don't wanna show us anything. But what Kirkpatrick said and did was prove that uh, you can sanitize those videos. And if what he said is true, like, clutter and UASs and so on, I would say the majority of what, what those explainable things are would be fine to show. I would think anyway. So I don't want to give them ideas, but why wouldn't you just line up the, the uh, videos? You know, you, you, even if you only had like five, let's just call it five. Here's a trash bag. Here's a, here's a seagull. Uh, here's a drone that we know that was flown by a 12 year old. Uh, whatever, you know, all of these explainable things. So we hear it, we should see it. Say dog, show dog. And yet we didn't have that. We had one unexplained and one explained, and that was it. Now, I'm sorry. I think that, that if you really did have this overwhelming number of, of um, pieces of evidence, why don't you show it? Why don't they proactively show it? And it sounds like Kirkpatrick had submitted this forward facing website, not only to submit material to, but if you catch one of his quotes, he said, essentially, they were going to declassify it and put it online. Now, I first heard about this last year, um, and I knew that it was something that they were pursuing. I wanted to write a story about it. And sadly, uh, it, it was essentially put on hold. And so I kind of gave up on it. And it was probably, quote unquote, put on hold because they just weren't approving anything. They meaning the upper echelon of OSD or OUSDINS. Why? I don't know. But regardless, now it's out in the public domain. Now we hear that that's the, the intention. So why not? Like, let's, let's do it. And I call on that, that MQ-9, coincidentally, shot by MQ-9 Reaper drone footage of the Russian aircraft coming in and spraying the fuel over everything. That was declassified what? Within like two days or three days? Clearly, they can do this. Clearly, they have the capability. Clearly, they're able to, yet they don't. When it comes to UAP, oh, sorry, John. Sorry, any FOIA requester. Even your legal argument you put up in an appeal is denied. Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick says, oh, we've got all this material, clutter, UAS is, it's all, per, you know, majority explainable. So roughly half is explainable. Where's that? You would think that you would just be quick to do it. And they're not. I don't understand it. So why isn't the public involved? I don't know. But that other thing I pointed out where he said NASA was first, then NASA tells all the department heads and federal agencies. Why is that the route to take? If they're really trying to do any aura of public transparency here and have that behind their effort, why weren't we as the general public mentioned? Uh, I'm not I'm not really sure. Uh, Adam, thanks so much, John. I would love for there to be questions in Congress about that, too. Not sure exactly what that's referring to. I think I'm a little behind in the chat room, but uh, uh, you're very, very welcome. Will you be attending Stephen Greer's disclosure event? Not in person. He's not a fan of mine. Um, I'm sure, you know, I don't know if it's going to be live streamed. I haven't really followed a lot of Greer stuff recently. Um, 
So if it's live streamed, you know, I'm always streaming something on one of these monitors while I'm working in my, my normal day job. I wish I could do the black vault all the time. So I'm sure I'll, I'll tune in and listen, but um, no, definitely not going to be there in person. Uh, Mike Rotunda, why does nobody ever talk about the many objects, lights, movements on the moon and in space? I think people do. Um, you know, you get those those videos, the the alleged, I say alleged because a lot of times they're not sourced, so it's kind of hard. But the headline is always NASA cuts live stream right before you or right as UFO enters frame or something to that effect. Um, so people talk about it. What intrigued me about Kirkpatrick's testimony was that he made an effort to say space and the way he said it. And again, this is just my opinion. He essentially alluded to the fact that he has anomalous cases in all three domains, space, air, and sea. So is he seeing that stuff from NASA? That's intriguing to me. We know the UAPTF um, had reached out to them and wanting to brief NASA, uh, pulled in the director of the International Space Station. I, I broke that story like two years ago. That was not known before. So it was like, why are all these people involved? It kind of was like a little bit of a head scratcher. So we could speculate, of course, but obviously they were touching base with NASA because they wanted that information. So to understand UAP in the space domain, to me, I'm speculating a little, it's clear they have anomalous cases. Does that include objects in or around the moon? Your guess is as good as mine, but I think evidence is there to support, maybe they are, uh, that it's a possibility. Bob Gray, uh, no question attached, but I really do appreciate the support of the channel. Thank you for that super sticker. I'm just going through the chat room here. Um, oh, Corey, Corey Myers. This is, uh, uh, I'm already going to get myself in trouble over the couple things I said today. Is it, it is my sneaking suspicion that Lou Elizondo is not legit. What do you truly think, John? Um, this is a this is a video in itself. I've done hours on the 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 stories connected to Luis Elizondo. So Corey, if if you're new to this channel, first off, welcome. Second, there's a lot of videos that are are definitely geared towards the claims of Luis Elizondo and and what he says that he worked on. There are many unanswered questions. I will say that comfortably uh, that remain. Have some unanswered questions been answered in the past? Absolutely. To be 100% fair, uh, of course, there are questions that I posed in, let's say, 2018 that have been resolved by now, but many have not. And I would actually argue the majority have not. As time went on, we see many more, not only contradictions to this whole story, but also what I would consider fabrication. Um, without doing a whole diatribe here on this particular question to prove what I just said, I point you to all of the work I did on showing the, um, evidence about the, the quote unquote release of the three original UAP videos, the stories we were told not only by Luis Elizondo, but to the stars Academy of arts and science, in my personal opinion, there is zero evidence to back up what they said. In fact, the evidence completely shows that all that was likely fabricated. My question is why? And that makes me question anybody. Um, if I did that to you guys, I would hope that you would question me and call me out. I don't, nor would I. But if I were to tell you stories, and I didn't label it opinion or speculation, but I was telling you this is the way that this happened. And I tell you a story. And then all of a sudden, a year later, two years later, comes out. None of it was true. I hope that you would hold me to account and deservedly so. That is my viewpoint on not only Luis Elizondo, but those tightly connected to him. Because the more they talk, the more that is said, the more is revealed. I try and tread carefully now talking about it because the amount of flack that you get, you go against the grain. So it ticks a lot of people off. So I try and stay away from it uh, as much as I can. But when it comes to the hardcore, factually presented pieces of the puzzle surfacing type of approach that I try and have to this, I bring it to you. 
and uh, and and not everybody likes that. I I don't want to say yes, he's completely not legit because he's done a lot of great stuff. Uh, specific to your question on Luis Elizondo, he's done a lot of great stuff and he saw, said a lot of cool things. But sadly, what's come along with that, in my opinion, is proven fabrication and misleading information. And it goes well beyond the videos themselves. So the bottom line here is why? It's not a popular stance to take. Some people say, oh, you want to stay relevant. I would be much more relevant if I hopped on the bandwagon and was like, yes, everything he says is true. Fully support it. Trust me, bro. Got sources that back it all up. No, I don't do that. It would make me more popular. You look around. So that's that rebuttal. To, 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 to this is so laughable, but people really believe that. They think that people attack Luis Elizondo because all of a sudden he's stealing the spotlight. Um, take the spotlight. I don't care about the spotlight. What I care about is what really happened. And when you look at just the information, take, take your personal feelings out, you take your personal bias out, you truly just stand out of your shoes outside looking in. There's enough to question what's going on. Why do we have these... Again, fabrications, these stories that we were led to believe in 2017, 2018, which are now provably untrue. Why do we have interviews of one person saying this is how it was? And then his buddy comes along and says, no, this is how it was. Why is that? You know, and you look at all of that. And that is specifically to how Christopher Mellon got the DVDs in a Pentagon parking lot and the stuff that he said, um, you know, it just it goes into this big what I would call rabbit hole, um, but you make you make a lot of connections with supporting evidence to show there's a lot to question. So I don't want to blanket call somebody not legit, but I think there's enough to absolutely justify questioning. And I'll get hate on actual evidence uh, and things people can can verify. What can we as the public do to help move this along? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't claim to have all the answers. You know, I, I think showing senators and congressmen that the public is generally interested, I think that there's nothing wrong with that, and it can do nothing but help. Um, recently, I was interviewed by Kurt Jaimungle with uh, the Toe podcast, uh, Theories of Everything, and uh, brought up kind of this and the effort of the big phone home and that type of stuff. And um, although the the founder of that has kind of moved on and changed viewpoints a little bit, those types of efforts, you know, look, they're not going to change the world overnight, but it doesn't hurt to get people motivated to call in and fax in and email in uh, interest. I don't think sending them Wilson Davis documents and uh, crashed alien saucers and S4 is the most helpful, uh, simply because I, I think that those are just, you know, more of the fringe that they don't want to be involved in. So I think keeping our elected leaders uh, knowledgeable to the fact that we are interested is helpful. And I also think that people speaking out against what I've been labeling the BS of the world, don't be afraid to question anything. You know, um, the truth doesn't stand on an eggshell. You don't have to tread carefully around it. You can throw boulders at it. And the truth will stand stronger than anything that you can throw at it. So throw stuff at it. Question people that are saying, hey, look, I've got sources. I can't tell you who, but there's like 30 of them. And they all tell me we have alien crash saucers. So I'm going to tweet about it. I'm going to do YouTube videos, but I'm not going to prove any of it. Uh, but that's how it is. I don't stand for that at all. I, I mean, just don't. I, I'm going to say that I've said it a thousand times. I'll have to say it a thousand times again. I get a lot of flack. People say anonymous sources belong in journalism. You know what I say? You're absolutely right. I've never said anonymous sources cannot be a part of journalism. In, in my opinion, when you solely source a story on an anonymous source, that's the issue I have. And every quote unquote big claim of recent days for the most part, not everyone, but for the most part, are done by either bloggers or British tabloids that are talking about anonymous source this, anonymous source that, s former senior defense officials, according to current defense officials. I, I mean, it's just like they have the same phrasing in all the articles. We know the three sources that they are uh, in, in most of those cases. And when we don't, yeah, I think that we should call people out. That's how you move this topic forward. You keep it serious. When you keep it sensationalized, 
then you are going to lose interest. And I think the last couple of years is, is showing why that's true. We have had so much built up about certain things. A 23 minute video of a triangle coming out of the water is a prime example. I don't even think that exists, but people chase their tails trying to say it does. And at the end of the day, the people that matter hear all that. They look into it. Wilson Davis documents. They make a phone call to Admiral Wilson. They, they're really going to accuse Admiral Wilson of lying. F well, fine. If they have to like drag him in under oath, then fine, do it. I don't think they will. But those are the types of stories they see. And there's no evidence really to back it up. And some people say, well, this person was on the document and they actually had health issues at the time. Well, that doesn't prove anything. It just proves that he may have a connection to the hoaxer. Right. I mean, like, look, it may prove ultimately that that document is real. And when it's proven beyond any shadow of a doubt, I will be very happy to admit that I was wrong. But until then, you know, th that's not the evidence we see. Uh, we should uh, put in the forefront for senators and Congress to see. So I think keeping it serious, keeping it grounded, keeping the um, interest level, but also on top of that, pushing back on the BS, you know, the YouTube channels that put up a just leaked to me today and talk about alien technology. No, nah. if you preface it by saying your source is is really credible and it turns out that like nothing is proven from your leaked information, you should be called out. And that goes for me, too. Look, if I ever do something like that, if I ever have done something like that, I haven't spoiler alert. But if I ever did, if I ever do call it out. And I, and I mean that because I, I really think this conversation is worth having. I really believe this conversation is worthwhile. And on, on, on top of that, it needs to keep grounded because the best thing that fuels the cover up is the speculation and the sensationalism. And if it goes unchallenged, then that's an issue. You're going to have more people lose interest like the media and like uh, our elected leaders. And in my opinion, this hearing, the most recent in April of 2023, proves that because you had two senators that showed up at the beginning, one that waltzed in during the middle, asked a question or two, waltzed out, two by the end, and a pit of people that showed up. Half of the seats were essentially empty, and quite a few were not with the mainstream media. That is not meant to demean them, by the way. But my point is, is those seats, that back row, journalists should be there. You know, they should be the ones grabbing Gillibrand at the end, asking uh, questions. And kudos to Dan for getting her to, to do an interview. Dan is one of my favorite people involved in, in, in this conversation. He does great work. So I want to stress, that's not meant to demean those that were there. But where are the fill in the blank. I'll name all of them. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, you know, whatever your your media outlet of choice. Where are those questions? Why aren't they doing the man on the street? And 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 I I, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that it maybe roots to that waning interest that I talked about last year that got a lot of heat. But sadly, that's what we're seeing. The report was late last year. The 2022 report was published in 2023. No one seemed to care on the congressional side. This hearing, which is a big deal on UAP, rooted in a big national security concern, uh, two senators show up, a third one waltzes in and out, and then barely any media. That to me is problematic. So I don't mean to, 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 to go preach in there, but I think that that's, uh, to your point, keeping that interest, keeping it grounded, that's the best. James, uh, you're the goat uh, for saying I'm the goat. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Bruce Wayne, Batman in the house, uh, Lou got a lot of people talking hundred percent. I totally agree. There's nothing wrong with that. What worries me though, is getting people talking on information. That's not exactly hundred percent solid because you will have, and I think you have, I think this is provable people that really go, wow, this is something based on Luis Elizondo or he, someone of of his background coming out and saying what he did and people start digging and people start smelling the part of the BS side of the story. It's not all BS. So I want to stress that yet. They smell that, see it, get abused themselves, get mistreated, 
uh, are, are, are completely used and they go, forget it. I'm out. And so it's great if somebody gets something, somebody talking, a group of people talking, that's great. And I'm not saying Luis Elizondo is the root of all this drama, but I can say there are quite a few individuals now that are, that are nameable. They're not anonymous sources. And I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, uh, there's quite a few people that if you look in social media have completely changed their mind about this topic that got caught up in it. We're talking about it, doing full YouTube shows, efforts to get people to contact their congressmen and senators and so on. And all of that is awesome. What happened? It flipped for quite a few of them. Why? Because they smelled that BS and were used. I want to know why that BS was thrown in with some of this other more interesting stuff and why the abuse took place. And, and I truly believe that used and abused. I, 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 I support that um, being said. So Bruce, I totally agree with how you typed it there. Uh, but I think it needs to be added to that. There's a lot of other stuff that, that we need to question. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it. Um, on why it's there and why it's unfolded the way it has and why certain people that were so vocal a year, year and a half ago have just disappeared that they barely you they barely surface to talk to you and i want to know why what what happened um you can only speculate but i i think that uh there seems to be more of a structured plan here than i mean i don't pretend to know what that plan is but i, I mean it's clear that there's something going on uh and i'm not sure what it is damian scott lazar isn't getting rich from his story no but i i guarantee in the beginning days that was the intent um, there, I, I know some of you may ask about the deep dive on Bob Lazar. Um, I just know that it would just be, a, a an incredibly insane effort. Uh, I've already started it in a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, it's taking too much time, but I think other, some of these other issues and videos are, are, are more important anyway. But, uh, regardless, there is a lot of, uh, being written right now about the root of Bob Lazar around the time frame that he came about. And again, I, although I don't like anonymous sources, this, this particular individual doesn't like to, to give their real name, and rightfully so. They do source everything that they say, however. Uh, so you're able to fact check and so on. They did do uh, interviews with certain people involved. Obviously, that's a little harder to fact check. Uh, but as of me talking about it today on April 25th, uh, when I've recorded this, I haven't seen any type of evidence to show that this person fabricated anything. So my whole point being is that even though it's rooted into a pseudonym, uh, all of the information they put forward is sourced. When you start looking at some of these issues, uh, it becomes incredibly uncomfortable. And you would you, in, into your thing about not getting rich. Well, maybe he's not rich, uh, but originally, what was the intent? Um, he was in a point in his life that maybe a money making uh, effort, maybe personal opinion. Uh, was something that uh, he wanted to pursue. You fast forward, he's got t-shirts on his website. They've got mugs. Um, you're telling me Jeremy Corbell and the popularity of that of that documentary didn't pay him a penny. He didn't compensate him. No, I'm I'm sure he's I'm sure he's getting paid. So does he have a, a 30 room mansion that he's living in? Uh, that that's not the point. Uh, the point is there is a financial benefit to the story of Bob Lazar for those that are closely surrounding him. Uh, and then also Bob Lazar himself, you wouldn't have all those commercial products or sending autographed posters or something without some kind of financial benefit. Um, so that said, I, I, you know, I, I can understand it's a point you want to make that he's not getting rich, but regardless, that doesn't mean he wasn't intending to. Dan, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Do you have a USO case that you consider credible? I'm off the top of my head. N no, not off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, but I'm also been going for two and a half hours now. And so I might be a little bit fried. So uh, I, I wouldn't have one off the top of my head, but I'll have to, to, to put my thinking cap on for you and get back to you. So I'm kind of, I think I'm catching up on the, so 1123. Oh, I'm way behind. 
Okay, so I might be just stumbling on some other comments. Dismissing Lazar because you think he's getting rich from it is just ignorant. I d well, I don't know if that's directed to me or not. I don't think he's getting rich, but I think I've already kind of addressed that. But I think I might be stepping into an all-capped conversation between two others. Um, do astronomers ever report seeing anything in space? Uh, yes, uh, actually. So a uh, big skeptical argument, and NASA actually tried to pull this, that uh, astronomers and amateur astronomers would be uh, really the first to, 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 to herald such a um, sighting that they would talk about it, they'd be interested in it, uh, and they claimed that they were not. And, and I, I've done presentations on this. It was part of their Ask NASA blog, and uh, that was their answer. And they have since actually taken that off. Uh, you can find it on Wayback Machine. But that was their answer, that as, uh, astronomers and amateur astronomers were not seeing UFOs uh, like actual people were. Well, I didn't make this particular document, but I did publish it on the Black Vault. It was a, a culmination of all astronomer UFO sightings going back decades. And there were hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, going back to even like Clyde Tombaugh, who, who discovered Pluto. I mean, I would consider him a reputable... Uh, astronomer that he was seeing uh, UFOs and documenting it. Um, so yeah, you've got a lot of astronomers that you can cite as educated people seeing UFOs, documenting it, and this particular document on the Black Vault uh, kind of archived all of that. Off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly who the author was, but I can uh, just either write me Mike or I will post it on social media. Um, so you can you can see that particular document, but it's it's really interesting and it's all sourced and everything with all the particular ones that uh, that that have the sighting. So I'm just going through more questions. I'm trying to get caught up here because I'm way behind. So it looks like I'm way behind in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. This is what happened. There's so many comments and questions. There's still 362 people watching this and the brunt of the presentation has been over for a little bit. Um, so thank you all for, for sticking around. Did this hearing mention Congress should consider laws to regulate amateur UAP investigators? Deborah Strayer, thanks for the question. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, no, the, the, the hearing didn't mention that. But what I did deal with, and you may want to rewind if you weren't around at this point, was some of the approved academic institutions or appropriately cleared uh, academic inst institutions and their industry partners, what they consider an industry partner. And that could be anybody in the private sector that they feel is either uh, cleared or appropriate to share information with. Connecting your question to that, I would say this is where they nece they don't necessarily have to create laws to regulate that. They can lock up those organizations that maybe have this desire for, for transparency and they, they want to investigate UAP and they want to do all that. But then all of a sudden Arrow comes along and says, hey, well, hey wait a minute, Group X, uh, you have a certain capability or knowledge or history or, or whatever uh, that could be useful to us. Why don't we get you cleared to come aboard, but you'll have to sign these NDAs or, and or if there's any security clearances, if, if any of these particular organizations have former government or military personnel, hmm, wonder who that could be. Uh, if they don't have a clearance already, they can renew their clearance, whatever the right path is, but essentially then lock up what their original intent was. So you don't need a congressional mandate or law for that. All of a sudden, Arrow it, it will be able to swallow up uh, these particular individuals that started out with the intent to tell you and I what their finding is and share that data. But then all of a sudden, they get a sweet deal from Arrow, maybe a paycheck, maybe a consulting fee, and uh, their ability to share with you and I is locked up. And that's what I fear when Kirkpatrick was talking about that, that that's what's happening, that, that there are concerns that these organizations that may have great intentions at the start could inadvertently get swallowed up into being able to not share a hundred percent of the, of the data. So yeah, I hope that addresses your question and concern. Um, Cause it's, it's one of mine for sure. Uh, 
I uh, there's so many, there's so many. Um, Bob Gray, I was Navy Snoopy team. That's cool. You have to send me some information on a Snoopy team. There's not a whole lot that's talked about when it comes to Snoopy. I did put the pictures though in the uh, in the presentation. Hopefully you saw those. Christopher Thomas, thank you so much for for that support. Thank you for your continued coverage. Your voice is important. Uh, you got it, Christopher. I appreciate that. Uh, sorry, there's no question attached. I'd be more than happy to answer for you, but really do appreciate those kind words. Thank you for that. Sometimes I always wonder if these longer streams are worthwhile to everybody, but I always appreciate the the, the feedback. I know I said it during the stream. I know they're not for everybody. Reese Holbrook, we all knew beforehand it's drip, drip, frustrating. John Legend, I appreciate the the latter part of that. Uh, yeah, it's it's frustrating as it does, whether it's an intentional drip or, uh, you know, just seemingly is that way. I, I don't see it as an intentional drip. Usually when people use that phrasing with me that it's um, it's a, a gradual drip of information leading up to a final type of disclosure, whether that be with a capital D or not, but a type of disclosure. For me, I, I don't see it as a drip drip. I see it as like squeezing as hard as you can that sponge that is soaked up everything, wanting to keep it in the sponge and getting drips out of it. That's how I kind of envision this, that it, it's taken essentially a lot to, to, to get that information. So drip or squeeze, whatever it may be, it is frustrating nonetheless. Uh, Corey, just so you know, I, I talked about uh, Luis Elizondo prior and kind of broadened it a little bit. Uh, you may want to rewind uh, just so we don't go to, over too much again. Um, yeah, I note your spelling correction there, but uh, yeah, you, you might want to just scroll back. It, it's a touch. It's a touchy uh, subject, but one that I think is is not over yet. John, have you seen a recent video clip of a saucer-shaped craft zooming off by a private jet, which was claimed to be captured by a model on that aircraft? Okay, <laughs> took me a second. Uh, with the eye roll and all. Y yeah, and that's all I'm always concerned about those. You know, you wonder the social media hounds that are looking for, for follows. UFOs is a great way to do it. You know, you throw something out there. Uh, I am familiar with the one that you're talking about. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a an analyst at all, so I, I couldn't sit here and, and kind of like break down and analyze the footage. I'm familiar with it. Past that, I, I wouldn't have anything to add at this point. I, I'm sure that there's quite a bit of talk that I've seen uh, uh, myself, but also others have probably seen of that particular video. And yeah, I wouldn't have anything to add for you. Um, you're very welcome, uh, Corey. <laughs> Some of these are funny. I can't read them all. Though. Um, John, do you plan on reading Lou Elizondo's come upcoming book? A absolutely. And I'll make sure that I, um, try and approach it with an open mind if it ever comes out. Uh, I, I don't know if you followed, a, I did a social media post on this. I didn't write an article or anything, but it was playing into, uh, a different story and it touched on very briefly Luis Elizondo's book. And I had asked the publisher, this was last year, um, you know, when is this coming out? Is there any type of date or anything? And they gave an oddly specific date in 2024. And I was really surprised by that. I was like, 2024, like, why are you guys advertising it years in advance? I mean, no offense to Luis Elizondo, but generally you don't advertise books like that unless, you know, you're, you're coming out with a president's book or, you know, something of, of like, you know, bestseller potential. And again, that's not meant to be demeaning, but you know, if this is, uh, yeah, about UFOs or whatever, I mean, you generally are, you're talking about a different kind of sales number. <laughs> I don't know what the, it's all going to come off as rude. I'm sure to some people, but I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying like, why would you advertise this years in advance? And so I, in the course of talking with the publishing company asked again, like, wow, 2024. And then they retracted it and they said, no, uh, that's that 
that's not the date. Uh, we don't have a date. He's still working on the book. So I published their most recent um, statement on it, but it was kind of a question mark. So is it 2024? Is it 2027? Is it next month? I don't know. I filed a FOIA request to the Department of Defense to see if he submitted a manuscript uh, to Dopser, which he most likely will have to do. Uh, Dopser does not endorse the book or fact check it. All they are making sure is that with Luis Elizondo's security background, that nothing he says in, in, infringes on classified information. So Dopser has reviewed you know many books on various topics. Uh, by authors. And uh, this is something that he would likely have to do. And uh, they had not had anything yet. So I took it that, you know, Luis Elizondo had not submitted his manuscript yet. Um, if that's the case, I mean, Dopser can take a long time. So, you know, if he still hasn't submitted it, it may not even be out in 2024, because Dopser is not going to do this in a day and a half. So they may take a little bit of time. So um, uh, with that preface, will I plan on reading it? Absolutely. Do I have my hopes up? It's going to be out anytime soon. Um, not, not really, but we'll see. Jay Burke, Greenwald, you are totally right about Lou. I appreciate that. And I'm open to be wrong, just for the record. I wanted to pull your comment. I appreciate it. Um, I'm open to be wrong. Uh, but sadly, as time goes on, I question more and more <laughs> about what really is going on. And uh, I'm not. I'm not sure where we're going with it, but I'm going to keep pressing nonetheless. But I'm definitely open to be wrong. Hey, John, quick question. How is it possible that the same objects that were unexplainable in the 50s show the same characteristics of what we cannot explain today? Russia wasn't so tech advanced in the 1950s. That's right, David. Uh, and that's an excellent point. I'm glad you brought it up. A lot of people forget that the conversation today uh, is not just a conversation today. It's been going on for decades and decades. Uh, I touched only briefly earlier in this video about the 1950s material and 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 the fact that if if some of this was classified technology from America and the United States, that we would we're kind of surpassed that 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 window. That at this point we would have a declassification that would allow us to start connecting to some of these UFO sightings of past that still kind of make us scratch our heads a little bit uh, and connect it and say, oh, okay, it was this X plane or it was this program or whatever it might be. And, and we don't have that. The problem with today's conversation is it's staying just today. And that's what, that, that's what concerns me a little bit is that you do have this amazing history of unknowns that may not serve Kirkpatrick when he goes to documents from the 50s or 60s, but it does serve collectively the conversation as a whole. The fact that you can't explain everything as clutter and UASs and spy technology from, from uh, our, our enemies around the globe. Is that part of the conversation? 100% absolutely. But you can't just attribute it all to that. And yeah, you go back to the 1950s, you didn't have UASs like that flying around and remote controlled by someone on the ground. You didn't have that. So, you know, you, there's, a th there's a lot I think that's forgotten about in this conversation. And, uh, and although history, when you go back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, it can get a little snoozy for some. You want the high tech Reaper drone footage, stuff streaking across the sky of Afghanistan. You know, you want all that stuff because you can re not you um, uh, specifically, David, but just you as the general public. We can relate to things that we know more in recent days, meaning uh, something streaking across Afghanistan. Well, maybe we've never been to Afghanistan, but we can relate to that a little bit more. When you hear about stuff that happened in a missile silo in 1960, whatever, uh, it's a little bit harder to 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 connect with those cases because in large part, you don't have the witnesses that go along with it. You don't have the pilots that are being interviewed on the history channel. You don't have the cases being highlighted on the front page of the New York times. It's much different. And to some people snoozy, but it's important. So yeah, I think, I think that is lost in today's conversation that this is something that goes way back and that conversation not only is lost, we forget the large part that at this point, if we really are talking about classified and secret technology, whether about uh, our own in today's world, that is our own or foreign, 
when you go backwards and you see similar characteristics, is all of that stuff still classified if it had the same root explanation? I would argue not. You know, the general public is what, about 30 to 50 years or so um, behind hearing what technology they really have. I think that's the fun overall formula, 30 to 50 years or so. Well, in some of these cases, we're decades beyond that, that window, you know, that that uh, that that threshold that seems to have to be met for us to understand and learn as, as us peons in the general public about classified uh, technology. And yet we still don't have that from cases that were 60 plus years ago. So why is that? I, I don't I don't know. But uh, but it is something that is very much forgotten about. Hi, John. Don't you think it's funny that they found that leaker so fast that they found out all this information about the balloon so fast, but mysteriously can't figure out UAPs out slash Havana, assuming you mean the Havana syndrome. Um, yeah. And I dealt with that a little bit in the presentation where uh, why do they seemingly ignore the UAP leaks? And yet something else happens about the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the, the, it's just like all hands on deck. Let's figure this out. And, uh, and I'm sorry. I I mean, I, I think that even though we're talking about UAP versus Ukraine and and the situation in, uh, Ukraine, I may have misspoken said Afghanistan, but the situation in Ukraine, meaning the, the, the leak from the last DOD situation, a leak is a leak classified as classified. So if you have somebody that's giving classified MQ nine Reaper drone footage out, that's problematic because they may on a Monday just have an MQ-9 Reaper drone UFO clip that they send out. But what about Tuesday? What about Wednesday? If they don't care about that classification uh, of the material and they don't care about their security oath, what other things can they can they put out? So some may argue, well, it's it's not as important, even though I would respectfully disagree. Let's get beyond that. It's the mindset of just leaking classified material, albeit, if you want to say, not as important about our uh, as then our, our troops in Ukraine or whatever it is. So I, I think that that's a, a moot argument. And um, and it's an interesting juxtaposition that they acted so fast on that and had somebody in handcuffs figured it out. And then that person is blasted on the media yet for years, we've seen multiple, what I, at least in one case, I can argue was classified. You had material from a classified briefing. It doesn't matter a quick point on that. It doesn't matter if it's unclassified material in a classified briefing, you can't extract it and go, there you go. It's unclassified. Sadly, it just doesn't work that way. Whomever had a hold of that classified briefing to leak it uh, did so with their security clearance in their pocket, and they cut out this information and, and sent it out. Um, regardless of them doing that, they didn't have the authority to do that. Uh, they And so they're not what they call a release authority. I talk about that a lot on this channel. They're not a release authority. So there was no official review and release of the information it was leaked so that's problematic uh and yeah the question mark is why um i I would speculate that there isn't an investigation into the most recent mq9 reaper drone footage that was put out i'm i I would bet a dollar that that either it's going on as i film this uh record this or in the future if it's not already done but i i think that there will be an investigation into that if not that's a bigger question on why uh, and we'll deal with that uh, if it ever is revealed. I'm going to have to uh, to end this pretty soon. I'm going to go through and see if I can find any more last minute questions here. Um, I'm probably missing stuff because my my screen here goes pretty quick. So I try and throttle it a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of comments. I'm way behind. Jazz Shaw, I'm afraid to even read this jazz, probably going to jab at me somehow. John is hiding the fact that he is immortal. That's actually true. I found his name in a blue book file from decades before he was supposedly born. True story, by the way. Um, Wait, I am immortal. Wait, did you really find a Greenwald in the book? There is uh, a Greenwald that would be my grandfather, who I found in classified documents. This is a true story. And uh, he worked on top secret rocket programs uh, and weapon systems through Bell Aircraft and a couple other places. That's true. So if the latter part, if you weren't being facetious jazz and you found a Greenwald, please let me know. 
Um, cause that would be very cool. But other than that, it is true. I am immortal. So thank you for that. Uh, and your support jazz. You're awesome. By the way, it's always fun to see you. Uh, Johan Berger, all thumbs up for the one and only Mr. John Greenbaum and all his work. Thank you, uh, Johan. I really appreciate that. And the, and the thumbs up. Holy moly. There are a ton of comments. 1207. Oh, I'm 10 minutes behind. Let me see if I can get caught up here. Um, again, I'm likely missing some. I just want to see if any stick out that I want to deal with here before we end. Then I'm going to have some lunch. I haven't had lunch. 12. Oh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So I got every, every one there. Um, so that said, uh, obviously we're approaching three hours. So if you've been hanging out for that whole time, kudos to you. Very, very cool. Uh, I always have a lot of fun with these types of videos and stuff like that with the behind the scenes, the actual segment that we recorded, just so you know, you will see, uh, that kind of clipped out, uh, cleaned up a little bit. I mostly just kind of run it live to, to tape, so to speak. And then, it will premiere on this channel. I'm thinking maybe Thursday night or Friday night. That way it's a more appropriate time. People can hang out, do the chat room again. So you will see that particular video again. Uh, but hopefully you'll subscribe to the channel. If you're watching on any other platform, I still see quite a few people on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, just go to the blackvault.com slash live. That way you're informed of all the content because those other social media platforms, you don't see everything. Uh, I'm contemplating changing that at this point, but it gets a little, little hard to upload the same video in numerous places. So most of the content is YouTube. Some of these live streams though, I do on all the platforms to reach all of you. So that said, thank you guys again for listening and watching. I truly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.